Okay, good evening, everybody. And welcome to the first council meeting for 2023. And um, I'd like to welcome councillors, staff, members of the public. And we've got a lot of young people here looking at democracy at um, in practice, which is wonderful. And um, all the people listening online at home, thank you for joining us. Members of the public that have registered to speak by audiovisual link or an agenda item are asked to keep your microphone muted and video off until I invite you to speak, please. Speakers will not be able to present material as part of their speaking time or share their screen. Everyone at this meeting is reminded to conduct themselves in a polite and professional manner, keep communication factual, use appropriate language and tone, do not use any defamatory or derogatory marks. Defamation laws apply to addresses in public forum. I also ask councillors to observe the requirements under the Code of Meeting Practice and Meeting Etiquette. On comment, um, for the efficient con conduct of this meeting, it is not necessary for you to repeat matters you agree with and raised by any previous speaker. It is sufficient for you to say that you agree with the points raised. I remind all present that the video recording is an official record of council and may be made available to persons upon request in accordance with the Government Information Public Access Act 2009. No other recordings are permitted. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the land on which we meet uh, and acknowledge the traditional custodians, the Gadigal and Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. The people of the Aura Nation, their spirits and ancestors will always remain with our waterways and the land, our Mother Earth. Before we um, move to our opening prayer, I would just like um, for us to take the opportunity for a minute's silence um, in relation to the, um, the massive devastation caused by the recent earth earthquake in Turkey and Syria heartbreaking scenes of injured people, crumbling buildings and entire areas totally destroyed. And it's been over two weeks since the initial earthquake and the affected regions continue to experience further shocks with more injuries and fatalities as recently as this week. So hundreds of thousands of people have been left homeless in the middle of winter and over a million in temporary shelter and in need of food and basic supplies. So. Countries around the world have pledged support, with Australia also offering $18 million in humanitarian assistance. Bayside Council um, and staff will be holding a fundraiser too, so that um, if anyone would like to um, donate, there are opportunities to do that. So if we can all stand and um, for a minute silence to think about the people in Turkey and Syria and the lives lost. Thank you. Please be seated. I now invite Reverend Andrew Harper from Bay City Church Arncliffe to open the meeting in prayer, please. Sorry. Stand. Why don't we bow our heads and close our eyes? God, we just begin tonight um, just praying for the individuals, the families of those of Turkey and Syria, God, we just, uh, our heart goes out to those families, many who lost loved ones and uh, many whose hearts are breaking and who are dealing with grief, but also on top of that, dealing with displacement from their homes, their livelihood, God, and all that they hold dear around them. And God, we do acknowledge in, in those scenes, we saw miracles, we saw People and children dug out 
of the rubble, God, not expecting to live. And we we rejoice in those moments. But God, our heart goes out to those people. We lift them up. And the safety of our nation, all that we have, we look towards them and we just pray that, God, that uh, the world would get alongside them practically in every way possible. And we thank you for our nation and what we are doing to help those people in this time. And God, I also just acknowledge as we head towards the election, God, I just pray for our democracy in this nation that you would have your way um, as we come towards March and a state election, God. And, uh, and finally, God, I just pray for our councillors, for our mayor and uh, our heads of council here tonight, God. I pray for them. God, I pray for our councillors. I thank you for their service, their dedication to our community. And God, you see the sacrifice it puts upon their lives, God, to be here and to to do and to hold up this democracy that we love dearly. And God, finally, I pray for tonight that wisdom would prevail in every single decision represented here tonight in your mighty name. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Harper. Please be seated. Thank you for taking the time to come and join us. Okay, this takes us to um, apologies. The following apologies have been received from Councillor Morrissey and Councillor Naji. Do I have a mover? Moved, Councillor Sedrak, seconded Councillor Jansen. All those in favour say aye. Against, declare that carried. Uh, this takes us to disclosures of interest. Um, so we have disclosures of interest. Um, I'm disclosing an... Um, an interest in 11.2, I think you can see the number, um, in relation to SS Rock. Um, it's a less than significant non-pecuniary interest on the basis that I'm Council's representative on the board of SS Rock, but there is no conflict between Council and SS Rock on this tender before the, before the meeting tonight, and um, I will remain in the chamber for consideration and voting. And, um, oh, sorry, that there's a number of tenders on the agenda. So I'll just, um, so for the same reason, um, I'm declaring purely because of my role on SS Rock in those, um, those tenders. In relation to um, item 12.1, notice of motion, um, I declare less than significant non-pecuniary interest on the basis that I attended the Banksy Tigers presentation night and have um, visited the club there before and however I will remain in the chamber and be um, voting on the matter. In relation to 12.2 notice of motion gambling harmonisation, I have a, a significant non-pecuniary interest and on that basis, as I am um, on the board, you can change that, Board of Clubs New South Wales, and um, I will leave the chamber and will not vote on this matter. Thank you. We'll move to um, next on my screen, Councillor Fardell. Yes, I'd like to declare a, um, a significant non-pecuniary interest on the basis that I love, live at Discovery Point Development and on the Board of Directors there, and the Board appoints contractors for various areas of the development, one is, which is Green Options, who look after our gardens. So I will leave the Chamber for consider consideration and voting on this matter. That's 11.2. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fardell. Um, that takes us to Councillor Jansen. Um, I'm declaring a less than significant non-pecuniary interest in item 12.1 on the basis that I attended the Banksia Tigers presentation and I'll remain in the chamber for consideration and voting on the matter. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jansen. <laughs> Councillor Saranowski. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm on the same uh, item in, in terms of 12.1. Um, I attended the annual presentation um, of um, for, the, for the, the soccer team, I don't have a, any of my kids that play there. Don't have any neighbours living in the joining area, so I'll be staying in the chamber. Um, the next one is 12.2. I am um, declaring a less significant non-pecuniary interest. So I'm a member of Ramsgate RSL, St George Lease Club, and B Bankstown Sports Club. I have no role in any of the um, committees or the organisations. I simply go there for. Um, dinner with my family, do not pay the machines, 
um, on it. So I have no role in the day-to-day -day operations of any of the clubs. Thank you, Councillor Saranowski. Councillor Sunis. I'm declaring a less than significant non pecuniary interest at item 11.4 on the basis that my street was recently on the footpath program rollout, which was fantastic after 32 years, and I'll remain the chamber for consideration of voting on this matter. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sunis. Councillor Werner. Yes, I'd like to um, uh, declare a um, less than significant non pecuniary interest in item 11.2 um, on the basis that I'm an alternate delegate uh, of the um, board of SS Rock, but there's no conflict between council and SS Rock on this tender. So I'll stay, I'll remain in the chamber for consideration and voting on the matter. Um, and the same goes for the other um, items, uh, CP 23.002 and um, CP 23003 which are all um, SS Rock tenders. Um, I would also like to uh, declare a less than significant non-pecuniary interest in 12.1 um, uh, as under clause 5.2 of the Bayside Code of Conduct, I no longer have a private interest as I'm no longer a member of Friends of Gardner Park. And under 9.5b, I don't have a close personal relationship with anyone who will benefit from a decision or, or disbenefit, um, nor am I under 9.5c involved in any management or administration or other activities of any organisation involved. And on this basis, I will remain in the chamber for consideration and voting on the matter. Thanks. Thank you. Um, General Manager. <laughs> I know, and it's quite unusual for the general manager to have a conflict of interest. But in this case, I do, in item 10.2, financial assistance request from the Bayside Business Enterprise Centre. As is the, tr the tradition, the general manager chairs the board of the Bayside Business Enterprise Centre, and um, I do have a significant non-pecuniary interest so on that basis, I won't remain in the chamber while you're voting on that matter. Thank Madam you. Mayor. Yes, Councillor Jansen. Uh, I'd also like to declare that a less than significant non-pecuniary interest in item 12.2 on the basis that I'm a paid member of the South Sydney Graphic Arts Club. Um, I'm not involved in any management or any activities at all, so I'll remain in the chamber whilst we're discussing that item. Thank you, Councillor Jansen. Are there any other? Councillor Wider. Uh, Madam Mayor, I'm declaring uh, a less than significant non-pecuniary interest in item 12.1, similar to other councillors, because I've attended the Banks of Divers presentation, I, and I will be remaining in the chamber to vote on the item. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor Wider. Any others? Councillor Douglas. Um, I'd like to declare a less than significant non-pecuniary conflict of interest in um, item 11.5, which is the minutes of the Bayside Traffic Committee meeting 14th of December 2022, item BTC 22.137, the trial closure of Bay Street, Brighton the Sand. As, uh, on the basis of perception, as I am a member of the Peaceful Bayside Action Group, which has been campaigning for peaceful streets in Bayside. So you're remaining in the chamber? Oh, yeah. I will remain in the chamber, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I too will take precautions similar to my other councillors. 12.1, uh, similar to the Banksia Tigers uh, reception dinner. Um, non pecuniary, less than significant. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cedric. Are there any, any other disclosures of interest? Sorry, uh, my apologies, um, Councillor Barlow has just notified me that um, in the past I've also stepped out for 11.3 uh, minutes of the City Planning and Environment Committee meeting CPE 22.002 summary of responses from the public exhibition of the draft community and verge gardens policy 
as I am a uh, a member of the uh, Bayside Community oh. Garden, and I will stay in the chamber uh, for voting. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Douglas. No other declarations of interest. All right, that takes us to the minutes of the previous meeting. Can I ask two councillors who were present um, at the, we'll do the um, first one first. So um, the minutes of the council meeting on the 23rd of November, 2022. Do I have a mover? Move Councillor Musket, second and Councillor Barlow. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against, declare it carried. Um, 6.2, the minutes of the extraordinary council meeting on the 7th of December, 2022. Do I have a mover? Moved Councillor Wada, seconded Councillor Jansen. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against, declare it carried. Thank you. This takes us to the mayoral minutes. We've got two mayoral minutes tonight. So the first mayoral minute is um, about improving customer experience at Bayside. So um, many of you um, will be familiar that Last year, our focus as a council was on presentation and um, there's been lots of improvements um, in presentation across our parks and playgrounds and um, foreshore and streetway. So the area is looking very, very good and I um, want to commend the work of um, staff that have put in that time and energy to really um, lift the standard of our area, making sure that we're all very proud of where we live. This year, as councillors, um, as we've discussed, a focus for council is to continue to improve customer experience across every area of council's activities. This starts with developing a culture where our customers are at the centre of absolutely everything Council does. So when we talk about customers, we talk about our residents, we talk about our businesses, we talk about everyone that interacts with Council. So this requires our staff to always put themselves in the shoes of the people that they serve, to go deeper in understanding how they can support and help them. It's really about bringing to life the things that we have committed to in our delivery program. So that included things such as developing a service review program, implementing a council-wide customer experience improvement program, and developing a program to measure and track customer service satisfaction. Implementation of Bayside Council's customer service charter so I'm, I'm pleased that um, those documents will be presented in the committee next week. So um, councillors and the public will have an opportunity to look at those and provide feedback because um, we want to make sure that, you know, we all serve um, at the, for our residents and we want to make sure that we are providing the best possible service that we can. So um, pleasingly, Council has been making very good progress. So we've hired a customer experience manager with a very dedicated team. We've got a new place liaison program has been implemented, which focuses on um, presentation and experience. The website has been, is being continuing to be improved to allow customers to submit applications more easily. We're using QR codes now for looking at um, different DAs that might be signed up on properties. So um, all those things to make um, the experience um, much more pleasant for you. So there will be more improvements in the coming months and um, council will be kept informed on this project. So some, some very um, exciting times and I just want to thank the staff as well for their commitment and buying into what will be a a big cultural um, piece of work across the whole organisation. So it'd be wonderful. Um, any speakers? Councillor Hannah. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Look, I'd like to commend you on this mayoral minute. <clears throat> and it's uh, terrific to be back before a live audience, refreshed, rejuvenated, reinvigorated, 
with an armory of alliteration and a pocket full of puns, Madam Mayor. Wonderful. <laughs> it's good to have you, you back. Know I'm, you know I'm big on this stuff, and I, and I do note that you mention mystery shoppers. Well, probably one of your most active mystery shoppers is currently on his feet. And what I would say to you is that all of these councillors around here are also mystery shoppers. So if we, if we can drive this empowerment right down to the people that are delivering the services so that the blinkers are off and they're looking around at things that need doing to make our city look better, I think this is very much very worthwhile. So I commend you on this, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hannah. No further speakers? I put the mayoral minute. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against, declare it carried. Thank you, councillors. Um, this brings me to my um, second mayoral minute. Um, and this mayoral minute is, is to recognise the service of councillor George Glenatsis. And um, I'd also li I'd like to welcome his daughter Anne and son-in-law Ricky and granddaughters Taylor and Jordan. Thank you for making the time to come today. And um, I wanted to um, put forward this, this mayoral minute because um, obviously it's with great sadness, um, you know, that, that I advise that those that don't know of the recent passing of former councillor George Glenatsis. Um, I think it's important when, you know, George served our community for a very long time. So I'd just like to take a moment um, to give a little bit of background. And I know we've also I'd like to welcome um, Ron Honig, member for Heffron, who's, um, I can see standing there, who's is also here and um, I'll be inviting um, Mr Honig to come and, and speak in a moment as well. So George served on the former Botany Council, which later became the City of Botany Bay in 1996. He served from 1991 to 2016 and held the office of Deputy Mayor from 1995 until he stepped down in January 2015. That is um, a really long, long service. And I had the pleasure of serving on council with George for four years. And George was a very committed advocate for his community. He was very passionate about, and you know, issues that were important to people. And he worked tirelessly. And together with his um, colleagues, he was always focused on improving the life of people in the community. And so, um, you know, George um, was a qualified auditor and um, he was very instrumental um, on council in relation to um, a number of things but yeah, and chaired a number of committees and um, was involved in a range of different things, was a delegate to S SS Rock and um, a whole range of things. So he was extremely um, honoured also to receive his Outstanding Service Award from the Local Government Association in 2014 in recognition of what was then his 22 years of service to our community. He was also very proud of his Greek heritage and its contribution to building a multicultural community where everyone from all backgrounds felt they belonged. And so George was a very humble down-to-earth man who gave much to his community and on behalf of myself, fellow councillors and the citizens of Bayside and staff, I extend our deepest sympathies to Anne and Ricky and girls and your extended family and um, just wanted you to, to know how valued George was and, and um, for his service and in recognition, um, Council, um, I'm recommending that we plant a tree in George's honour and that will be planted at Jellicoe Park, which was one of his <laughs> special parks there and um, which recognises his service to the community. So um, are there any, before I invite um, the member, are there any other speakers? So I put the motion, all those in favour say aye. aye. Against, I declare it carried. I now invite Mr Ron Honig, MP, would you like to address council?
Thank you, Madam Mayor, for the invitation. And your minute has accurately reflected on George Galanatsis's service. He was a, he was elected in 1991 on the, and uh, served till 2016 when the council was amalgamated. And he served as deputy mayor for 20 years, and for almost 17 years he was actually my de my deputy when I was uh, the mayor of the city of Botany Bay. That might reflect his time of service, but it, it doesn't reflect George, uh, his, or what he actually did, or what he was actually like. It was a, quite a difficult exercise for George to be elected in 1991, when he decided he wanted to, to serve the Botany Bay community. There were many opposed to him. And like, a, like anybody who has to work to get themselves elected, he first had to get pre-selected and had to get the support of fellow Labor Party members and, and um, um, the, the opposition, uh, the, the abuse he and his supporters and his family received from people um, within the Pagewood Hillsdale branch of the Labor Party, some of terrible, terribly racist comments that were directed particularly to his family meant that it, for him to persevere and for him to be elected, he really had to go through, um, he really had to fight his way through. And I suppose once pre-selected and then, and then elected, uh, he, he had gone through um, somewhat of a baptism of fire that most people don't go through uh, to, for him to value and respect the office of councillor that, uh, that, that, that he had. George always had a sense of humour. <clears throat> when you were elected to Botany Bay City Council, uh, you were given a nickname, and the nickname was usually selected by someone. George decided that he wasn't going to have anyone give him a nickname that he didn't want given to him, so he decided he'd give, his own, give himself his own nickname. His initials were GG, and he nicknamed himself The Horse. Um, after having nicknamed himself The Horse, he, he then decided he'd nickname his daughter Anne, who's in the gallery, as, as The Foal. And I, I must say, probably since 1991, I've only ever heard Anne referred to as The Foal. When her father passed on away on Boxing Day, she sent me a, an email to, to advise me of the sad passing of her father. And, and she said in that email, with The Foal by his side. Uh, by the time George got elected deputy mayor, he decided that, that um, being the horse wasn't good enough and he gave himself an honorific title of Dr Horse. And um, from that moment on, virtually all the councillors, um, other than in meetings, referred to him as, as Dr Horse. And I think he, he valued that title. Uh, we also presented him uh, shortly after that with a, with, with a baseball cap that had embroidered on the top of it Dr Horse. Um, which, which was one of his valued possessions. I don't know whether Anne still got that. Um, for 17 years, he served as my deputy. And deputies support the mayor and they provide assistance. And, 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 and if you're fortunate enough, you have a loyal deputy over that period of time. And I know with my experience in local government, that's not a regular thing to occur. But George was more than a loyal deputy and he, and he became a friend providing wise counsel. But he was always available to take on the heavy work and, and the difficult work off my shoulders. For all those obligations that I had, uh, I was able to pick and choose those that, that, that I could discharge and I knew I could give the rest to George. He was extremely popular as he moved through the community. He was respected, he was a gentleman, he was always well-dressed, took great pride in his appearance and had a love of, of, of the community. The people look back at my time as, as mayor and say, well, you know, th this guy got 85% of the vote every time he went to the polls. Um, I might have got the vote, but, but I was only able to do that because of the, 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 the support, the assistance and wise counsel that I got from George. Um, the council, as, uh, as many of you even today have discovered, the, the old Botany Bay City Council was enormously popular with its community and was very r responsive to, to the community. A and, and that relationship between the community and the council, George provided 
um, an integral part of that. Most of my success that I, that I received was as a result of George's support. And his wise counsel extended just beyond local government matters or political matters, they also extended to personal matters. For some years he did my tax return, although I, although I found out in recent years Steve Campbell was signing off on them. Um, and and uh, I also found out in recent years that he, he was always putting them in two or three years late. But, but at least I could give him a shoebox of, uh, of receipts to get it off my, get it off my plate. Um, I said he had a sense of humour and, and, and he also was a master of winding up people and he knew exactly how to wind them up and he knew exactly what to say to wind them up uh, to see what their, their, what their, their reaction was and that was the way he used to test them and used to provide wise counsel to others. He could read people like an open book and, and um, all that was much to my, was much to my benefit. Um, much of his wise counsel I followed when I didn't follow, follow it and, and the consequences occurred. He always reminded me that I should have listened to him in the, in the first place. He never let that opportunity pass. Um, one of the last prophetic things he said to me was, um, it was 2012 and shortly before the local government elections, the, the Labor Party had approached me um, for about the fourth time to run for Parliament and I'd agreed on that occasion, but I was a public defender and I was in court every day and, and um, um, there were these urgent documents that had to be, uh, had to be signed, had to be signed and, and um, George brought the documents into my chambers and the public defender's chambers were then at 1 Oxford Street on the top floor and I had a corner room on the southwestern corner and it looked from, you know, the airport across the cricket ground all the way to North Head. Uh, from the from the top floor and he came in and he stood on the corner and he looked at the view and he just looked at me and said you're giving all this up for a dog box in macquarie street um, and some would say that i should have accepted his wise counsel then um, you know to to serve a, a community as you know as elected councillors is not an easy task to balance everybody's interests and the competing interests and the pressure that, that you are placed on every day with people with pecuniary interests, although you don't have to decide development applications th these days, but, but um, the pressure on individual councillors is an enormous and the demands are, are enormous. And just think that if you do that in a leadership position and you do it for, for the decades George Galanatsis did it um, is rather remarkable. You have to be a special person to keep getting re-elected. You have to be a special person to be able to work as my deputy for 17 years, I can assure you. Um, and, and you have to be a special person to be able to serve that period of time and, and love the community. I, I suppose after I left office in 2012, I didn't see a lot of George. The, um, the place where he lived got redistributed out of my electorate. My electorate has four local government areas, so my time is divided amongst four local government areas a and uh, and I made a point of when I left Botany Bay City Council that I would be completely uninvolved in council affairs. Um, new people were elected and it was for, for them to decide, not me. Um, and that, and uh, they only ever heard from me if the bureaucracy dudded one of my, one of my constituents. So, so um, over that period of time, um, over that period of time, we sort of lost contact and lost touch. I didn't want to compromise him in respect of his duties and he had uh, views of, of which he wanted to implement at the council. But as I said, nobody serves that length of period of time unless they're very special and unless they have the community in their heart. And that was something that George Galanatsis had. And so uh, it's with great pleasure that I pay tribute to him. I thank him sincerely for his service to the community um, in his passing, he, he goes with, with, with the, the affection and value of the contribution that he's made to us all. Vale, George Galantzis. Thank you very much. I invite the family up and Ron, would you like to stay for a photo?
Thank you, councillors. That takes us to um, items by exception. So I'll, we'll work, we'll go around the table. Please let me know if there are any um, items you would like to pull out for debate. Um, Councillor Musket, no. Councillor Fadell, no. Councillor Jansen? Thank you. Councillor Saranowski, Councillor Sunis, Councillor Werner. I was just wondering if we're going to pull out the um, uh, the call for notices of motion for councillor attendance to the local government um, association, the Australian Local Government Association. Yes. Uh, and the waste conference. Yep. And um, I think there was one. Uh, and 10.5. Yeah, 10.5. Yep. Yep. Thank Thanks. you. Councillor Wada? No. Councillor Barlow? Sorry? So which minutes? 11 point? Yep. Thank you, Councillor Barlow. Zero... Um, Oh, one, one. Thank you, Councillor Barlow. Good pick up. That's good pick up. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Hannah. Oh, of course. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Hannah. Uh, <laughs> Councillor Douglas. No, Councillor McDougall, Councillor Cedric. All right, so I'll just um, review that, um, therefore, these are the items that we will pull out. The items I do not call, we will move by exception. So we are pulling out item 10.1, 10.2, 10.4, 10.5, 10.6, 10.7, 10.8, 10.9, 10.10, 10.11, 10.12, 11.1, number 004. Um, I don't need to pull out Verge, do I? No. Yep, 11.2, all of the tenders. 11.3, the um, 002. 11.5. Um, the new footpaths, so 11.4004, and all the motions. And also in 11.6, we'll pull out item 014 as we do have a um, speaker, public forum speaker to that one. Any, have I missed any? Okay. Um, Therefore, all other items will be dealt with by one resolution. May I have a mover and a seconder? Moved Councillor Jansen, seconded Councillor Musket, that the recommendations included in the business paper for the, fo for the items um, called out be that, were not, that were left um, in there be, be adopted. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against, I declare it carried.
Thank you, councillors. All right, this now takes us to the public forum. So the first um, speaker on the public forum. So um, please be advised that in relation to um, public forum, where there is more than two speakers on an item in, in accordance with council's code of meeting practice, that each speaker will be allocated two and a half minutes. So members of the public who have applied to speak at the meeting will be invited to address the meeting. So the first item we're going to look at is item 11.6014. This is in relation to a matter that went to the traffic committee, which is Saxby Close Botany. So what was pro proposed was the conversion of no parking restriction to no stopping restriction. And so the background there for the um, purposes of that is it is a um, emergency vehicle area. So, um, and it's where all the fire hydrants and those things are. So when there is cars, what happens, even though it's um, no parking, what happens is people park there and leave the car unattended. And um, there's a lot of unit development in that area. So, um, should emergency services be required, then it would be um, an issue with them not being able to ac access the area, hence to provide the context. So I now invite um, Mr Halperin, um, who is on Teams, and he's speaking against the officer recommendation. Are you online? Mr. Halperin? I, I am. Oh, I miss. Am. I, my so apologies, much. Miss. Sorry. But that's okay. That's okay. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, so I'm a resident of the area and I'm very well aware. I've just moved in here about four months ago. Very well aware of the cul-de-sac and very well aware of the actual fire hydrants and the reasoning of the emergency, which I wasn't even taking that into consideration. My issue for wanting to speak tonight is that it's a highly residential area where it's highly condensed with apartments. And I think that rather than taking away parking from us, we should be given the opportunity to park um, and our visitors should be given the opportunity rather than making minimal parking allowance. Hmm. Thank you. Um, I also feel that the cul-de-sac is big enough for emergency vehicles to actually park in the centre. It's a wide enough area to actually allocate um, the allowance for safety in regards to residential parking as well. Thank you. And that's really all my feedback. So thank you so much for the opportunity. No, thank you for coming in and um, raising your concerns. Thank you. All right, um, councillors, we we have the item um, in relation to the recommendation, which the recommendation was um, that we that um, the traffic committee, which has emergency services and police that are part of that traffic committee, have proposed the conversion of no parking restriction to no stopping restriction. Um, is there any? Move the original. Yeah, moved. Councillor Barlow, second Councillor Sunis. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against, declare that carried. Thank you very much. All right, um, this now takes us to item 12.1, which is um, an, a notice of motion to, in relation to Gardner Park. So we have a number of speakers, so I'm working off my list here. So um, due to the number of speakers, um, as per the Code of Meeting Conduct, um, speakers will be given um, two and a half minutes. If I can ask you not to repeat any points that a previous speaker has made, and um, you will get a warning bell one minute um, before the time ends. 
So the first um, speaker on my list who is speaking for the notice of motion, I have a Mr Garnett Brownbill um, who is speaking for the motion. Is Mr Brownbill present? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brownbill. Thank you. Uh, Madam Mayor, councillors, thank you for the opportunity to present and discuss with you my thoughts and concerns regarding item 12.1. Tonight, councillors, you will no doubt hear from those opposed to the proposed motion about how it will impact the local soccer community, how that young boys and girls will be affected, that young children will not be able to play, and that there will be impacts for the soccer club and the soccer, soccer association that use this field. But what you won't hear about are the impacts to the elderly who used to come and sit in the park to chat, the bocce players and their onlooking group of friends who would meet up nearly every day, the dog walkers who would come together to socialise their dogs and chat. You won't hear about the young mums and the mothers groups who used to meet at the park, the laughs and enthusiasm of highly dedicated Nepalese cricketers and who now have nowhere to play within the LGA, or those who enjoyed yoga or did leisure activities, Pilates or meditation. And you certainly won't hear about the families wanting to fly kites, play hide and seek, or learn about the natural flora and fauna of the park and enjoy the natural beauty. What a shame it is that this case and that council were apparently tone deaf to these community members of which over 330 were willing to sign and put their name to paper detailing the concerns and disapproval. This was not an online Facebook post, a WhatsApp group, or a message of a call to arms that has clearly occurred here tonight. Sadly, Council was made aware of these issues in 2015. Martin Shepherd, the consultant used by Rockdale City Council, indicated that hours of use may be limited due to the surrounding residences affecting return on investment. There existed equity issues. Re-access for community use may be limited due to existing licence arrangements with the Banksia Tigers Football Club. Council clearly failed to heed these warnings and thus is presented with the issues today and the 330 concerned community residents. Since 2018, Gardner Park has had a substantial increase in usage. From information accessed from Council, Gardner Park has had an increase of usage of nearly 300 per cent. Training for juniors was four nights a week, seniors two nights a week and only during the months of April to August. This equates to roughly 120 days of use. Today, however, Gardner Park has been hired for 315 days of the year, with both the main field and the second field being hired. This is incredibly concerning given the statements and media releases provided to the community members by Mayor Council and staff that there would be no increase in usage. That's my Thank last you. sentence. Thank you. A second up. Thank you very much, Councillor Summers. Um, moreover, given Council policies, the Bayside uh, POM, the Conservation Management Plan, the playing of soccer within the summer month is contradictory to both these plans. Cricket should be played instead. Moreover, given policies, base, uh, sorry, cricket can no longer be played and instead the fields are booked nearly year round for football. In the CMP policy, the Conservation Management Plan, Policy 52, in managing Gardner Park, ensure that it remains inclusive of the whole community and all recreational user groups and prevent the perception that the park belongs exclusively to any one group. That's your policy, your conservation management plan. 315 days of the year, this park is hired by one or two soccer associations and maybe a school group on an occasional day. How can this be the case if Gardner Park is hired for 315 days? Policy 41 of your conservation management plan. Ensure that Gardner Park remains as community open space and continues to fulfil the purpose to which it was originally acquired for amenity and recreational benefit for the whole community. Again, 315 days of the year, 
both fields, 5 p.m. till 9.30 at night, that's the community's place. That's where local residents should be able to go and feel as though they can walk their dogs, talk to people, chat, have a space. That's what it was. That's what it would hopefully be. Thank you, um, Mr. Brownville. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Saunders. Um, the second speaker who is speaking for the motion is Ms. Catriona Carver. Ms. Carver here. Madam Mayor, councillors, um, welcome everybody, hello. Um, and thank you, Councillor Werner, for bringing up this motion. Um, I'm Katrina Carver. I'm also the president of the Natural Turf Alliance. The Natural Turf Alliance is a group of 12 communities also affected in the same way that Gardner Park. So Gardner Park is not alone, as residents are also fighting the same usage problems around Sydney. The Natural Turf Alliance has also worked with the Department of Planning and the New South Wales uh, Chief Scientist is about to release a report into synthetic turf fields so that you all have ideas around how this is affecting communities. The report is currently on the desk of um, Minister Anthony Roberts. I agree that the usage has changed and the bookings reflect this. You've heard that from Mr Brownville. There is no off season anymore. Residents were promised no increase of usage. There was an off season. We used to be able to just have our school parties there. There are no school parties. There are no birthday parties. There is no place for us to go and have a party or have our school children who don't play soccer. I'd also like to bring up the issue of gender. Young girls, young teenage girls feel a little bit uncomfortable going to a park when there's lots of loud, angry men, sorry, I shouldn't say angry, loud men actually um, playing soccer. Uh, my teenage children are not actually comfortable going out to the park and just lying around. So I just feel as though it's an uncomfortable environment for girls and young people. The history of the park is that it was actually paid for by the council and also residents back in 1911. So it's always been a residence group. It was also a $2.5 million community grant that was actually given to the community, not just to the soccer thing. The change of surface has actually been successful for the soccer community, and I can see that you're all here today, but it is not successful for the other residents. There are other people who live next to the park who are woken up at 6.30 in the morning with kicking of soccer balls. I'd actually like to say that I'd like some reports done into the acoustics. The acoustics of the park are fantastic. There used to be um, operas and concerts there. That is why the soccer field is actually much louder than it could normally be because of the bowl-like surface. We have people with babies who are actually hearing the balls and the lights and the noise and the thumping of the coaches boxes at nine o'clock at night. These are the sorts of noises that residents are actually having to put up with. There was no acoustic report. There was no traffic report. And this is one of the requests. I'd actually like a report done into acoustics and traffic. Thank and that you. should solve it for the community. Just thank you. Is there a seconder? Thank you. Um, um, can I just remind councillors though that if an extension is, the reason why we've kept it to two and a half minutes is because there's a number of speakers. So then that, that same um, opportunity will then be provided to all speakers, just so council is clear. Thank Another you. minute, thank you. Thank you very much. I'd really like to say that we're here again. Gardner Park brings a lot of passion because we do actually really like the park. We'd all like to use it in a much more equal basis. So on that, I would actually like this conversation to be put into a report. I'd like a mm -hmm. acoustics, traffic, and also the usage to be tabled so we have something that we can all work with. And I'd like to actually talk to all of the, uh, the soccer community We'd like to sit around and we'd actually like council to facilitate something for all of us to actually discuss this usage because it's been two years. We're here again. You guys have actually seen the whole Gardner Park thing again and I'm sure you think, here we go, Gardner Park. I think this needs to be solved and it needs to be solved on a round table with council's help and reports that we can all sit around and agree upon. Otherwise, it's just opinions again and again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms Carver. The um, next speaker who is speaking for the motion is Mrs. Maria Ellenson.
Madam Mayor and Councillors, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I agree with the motion submitted by Councillor Werner. This petition outlines the concerns within the local community with over 330 community members signing, mainly from few surrounding streets. It is not a quick online petition with people signing from everywhere. It is a petition signed by people who live close to the park and includes our elderly and represents our diverse multicultural community. It is not a few people, but in fact, the vast majority with over 92% of residents supporting the petition and whose life quality is deeply impacted by flow and effects such as traffic chaos, parking, loud noise, light spill, etc. And has become a significant public nuisance as the park now is used by soccer from 6.30 to 9.30 p.m. and bookable by soccer clubs on a daily basis from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. all year round with no respite for residents. This demonstrates that promises made by Council that upon completion of this toxic synthetic grass, there would be no changes to the usage of the park, and that includes how often and the times the field is booked by local sporting clubs. This has been breached significantly and usage more than doubled. Residents strongly express that they feel extremely upset about the inaction of Council and feel that Council hasn't followed up on their promises and instead commercializes the park. The perception is that council only caters to soccer, despite us all paying rates, that locals have been pushed out of the park and lost their quiet, peaceful, natural space they loved so much. A lot of neighbors are older, and it's heartbreaking to hear how they stopped going to the neighborhood park. Some of them can't just drive somewhere else to find what they've lost and have no other park to go. We ask you to please follow up on your promises that there won't be an increase of usage and think it is only fair that the grass field is excluded from any bookings and instead landscaped with greenery to make it pleasant and relaxing space for residents to come and meet and enjoy our neighborhood again. There is no balance of needs, but instead a park handed over to one sport. A win-win is possible. Other councils with similar issues have demonstrated this, and I'm happy to provide you with more information. Most of us don't play soccer, and we are Banksia and your community too. This situation can't continue. We suffer from inaction of council every day. Please show us that we can trust you. These issues created through no community consultation. This, dear council, won't resolve when further ignored. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Johansson. Okay, that um, brings us to, we have some speakers against the motion. So I'd like to invite Mr. Hassan Shebli. Um, Thank you, Mayor. Um, so in regards to some of the accusations around the excess use uh, and the 315 days, I think the only way you can justify that is by going into the council's booking system to confirm what was booked before synthetic and what's booked after synthetic. I can tell you 315 days is very excessive and nowhere near reflect the, the current bookings that we have at the park. So in, in, uh, in a nutshell, Gardner Park is, is the home of Banks of Tigers, but however, it's, uh, it's, it's used by local schools, Football St George, other sporting clubs like St George Football FC, um, St George FC, the local community. The usage of the park by Banksy has not changed. We used to book the park Monday to Friday and weekends before the synthetic field project, and today we are booking the same time slots for the upcoming winter season as per the DA conditions 2017. 156, which stipulates we can do Monday to Friday up to 9.30 p.m. The grass field area at the northern end of the field is designated area for our under 8s, 9, 10, 11s and 12s. Football St. George schedule competition games over the weekends in the winter season and we run our training session from there as well. If we exclude this area as requested by Councillor Werner, this will reduce the playing area for the under 8s to under 12s and football St. George will not be able to schedule any games over the weekend for this age group. Just so you know, the western part of the field is all grass open area and uh, it's never used by soccer. So we are the true community representatives and we have, we're delivering a great service for the community. We have 500 registered players between the age of 6 and 18 years old. 80% of them reside within the Bayside Council. Okay, so if we want to talk about petitions and getting 300 petitions, we're very, very capable of getting thousands of people to sign petitions within 24 hours or 48 hours. 
I'm not going to go down there because that's a pointless, it's a pointless exercise. Today, Banks of Tigers FC is considered one of the leaders of the local FSG grassroots clubs. We have a huge presence and a great reputation, which we earned over the past decade. Due to the hard work and commitment by many devoted community members, we believe the club has become a social hub for the community. At Bankshire, we operate our own canteen. We employ our, our youth. We teach them commitment, discipline, responsibility, punctuality, and improve their confidence. We run educational sessions to address drug and alcohol issues, health and well-being. We carry out youth camps for the girls and the boys in the summer season to give the youth unforgettable experience and to teach them morals, ethics, team building, attend to their social and well-being needs. Banksia Tigers is more than a football club. I ask a few councillors to continue to provide necessary support and facilities to help us and other local football clubs deliver more to the youth of Bayside. Our members are constantly harassed, and I know that council members have been harassed for years. Um, Second. Second. By individuals who come down to Gardner Park to cause trouble. Those no, these nine individuals to the club take photos and videos of young kids training at the ground constantly. They let their dogs run around unleashed with an intent to cause harm. In October last year, we admitted a six-year-old boy to hospital because of a dog attack at Gardner Park. Police were attended, attended the scene. The kid is now afraid to come down to, and play at the park. We had two other incident led to dog attacks in recent months, and we have requested council staff to erect more signs around the park to ensure dog walkers adhere to the signs. This request has, been, has not been actioned to date. In conclusion, I'm not surprised of the motion raised by Councillor Werner at all. She was one of the leaders of the Friends of Gardner Park group who took Bayside Council to court over the synthetic project and costed taxpayers hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal and court fees. One can draw very strong inference from Councillor Owen's action that she acts on behalf of the Friends of Gardner Park. And in fact, although publicly declaring she's no longer part of the group, her agenda and actions have not changed. She does not declare her conflict of interest when raising motion. Her, her ongoing actions against banks and targets need to stop. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chibley. I now invite Ms. Irene Hatsipetrios, um, Chairperson and Executive Director of Football St George, who is speaking against the motion. Madam Mayor, Dr Christina Curry, Councillors, General Manager Meredith Wallace, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Today I give rise to talk against the motion tabled as Stop the Commercialisation of Gardner Park. As the Chairperson and Executive Director of Football St George, a football association which is the largest community sporting organisation in the St George region, I take this opportunity to firstly thank Council for the remarkable work they have done in providing such amazing facilities for the community. We also take this opportunity to thank the state government following extensive consultation with the community for the contributions made in the delivery of such a great precinct. Our association and amazing clubs such as Banksia Tigers Football Club who occupy Gardner Park are not-for-profit organisation, organisations run by volunteers and who dedicate a voluminous amount of time each year by providing a service to the community. Again, Football St George and our clubs are not-for-profit entities and not commercial operations. Football St George and its 22 affiliated clubs have seen over 10,500 registered players each year and include a number of volunteers and families, which equates to approximately 40,000 interested parties that are certainly passionate about the delivery of community grassroots football. Our numbers to date and for the 2023 season show an increase of 33%, which include lots more children and female particip participants wanting to play sport. The fact of the matter is that we need more grounds such as Gardner Park to meet the growing demands of the community. The suggestion of removing the grass field at the northern end of the park will take away from the access and playing and training times for young boys and girls and will be detrimental to our football community. 
We certainly don't want to turn away young children who want to participate in community sport. It is incumbent on all of us to provide opportunities to increase, not limit, active and healthy lifestyles in our community through participation in organised sport, especially for our children. Taking away any of the grass fields would only cause the need for more utilisation of the all-weather pitch and will certainly not take away from the time that is being utilised based on the requirements of the community. Gardner Park has long been used by the local community on weeknights for football training and on weekends for football matches, noting that as a result of the insufficient lighting, no games are held on Friday evenings as a result. To provide council with further information as to the use of Gardner Park, the association... Extension. Please continue. Thank you. The association calls on registrations by end of February before the season commences. The clubs are required to access the grounds for trials. It's a part of their duty of care. Council has provided an amazing asset to the community and an asset that should be used for its intended purpose. Gardner Park, if some of us here this evening may recall prior to Banksia Tigers caring for and utilising the grounds back in 2005, the condition of the park was abhorrent. Having a reputation, as I recall, of being a park that was used for illegal conduct, and if I may, Madam Mayor, a drug hole. This is certainly no longer the case, and what we now see is a facility that is utilised by the community playing community sport. Sedentary behaviour is a high risk factor for ill health in Australian society. There are a number of diseases most closely linked to physical inactivity and the risks associated with physical inactivity are highest for our children. The Australian Department of Health identifies organised community sport as an important contributor to reducing sedentary behaviour. I don't believe the department has identified landscaping in reducing sedentary behaviour. Organised community sport and football has the potential to improve the fitness and health of children in both a, a physical and mental capacity. Whilst improving cardiovascular endurance and flexibility through playing the games, players experience a boost in self-esteem being encouraged by fellow teammates while receiving the opportunity to refine their problem-solving and leadership skills. May I also address this matter in relation to the supporting statement and the last paragraph. The allegation that many don't visit the park anymore as they no longer feel welcome should be addressed. Banksia Tigers Football Club, as we've heard tonight, is one of the most welcoming clubs that we have in our association. They are pro proactive in looking after their community. You've heard tonight as well that they have continuously been um, uh, bullied, harassed, uh, dogs off leads, videotaping of children uh, without the consent of parents, and it's conduct that we, we don't accept. So if, if you come into my home as an example, I certainly wouldn't welcome you if that's the way that that's the conduct that's going to be um, displayed. So please, we ask our members of community that are projecting any hostility towards our club, we encourage you to stop. Um, we have a duty of care to look after our clubs as well. We encourage council to please allow us to let little kids play. That, that's a fact. Uh, and as I mentioned previously, our numbers are increasing. It is important to get not just young people, but older people to the grounds to play sport. You also heard that the grounds aren't just for Banksia Tigers Football Club. They share it with the community. And as I mentioned previously, we have over 10,500 registered players. So I thank Council to consideration, for their consideration and the opportunity to talk this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nancy Petros. Okay, councillors, um, that um, one of the speakers um, withdrew. So that's the, um, there are no more speakers to this. So we um, have a motion that has been submitted um, by Councillor Greta Werner. Do I have a mover? Move Councillor Werner, do I have a seconder? Seconded Councillor Douglas. Would you like to speak to the motion? So I'd like to thank everybody who spoke today. I think it's really important that we hear from the community and from uh, all the members of the community. And um, this is actually why I brought the motion. Uh, this petition has been sent to council 
And this motion actually says that council notes the concerns of residents and it's simply asking to bring back a report to council on what actions council can take. So it's not actually um, say, it's not actually uh, saying the things that are in the petition. It's basically saying to note the concerns and bring back a report. So given that, I think it is incredibly important for council to um, to recognise the concerns of residents and. Um, and I think that that's why we should really support this motion. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. And Councillor Savinovsky. Would you like to answer the question? Thank you. Um, so for, with commercialisation, uh, and I understand that uh, the Banksia Tigers are a not-for-profit organisation and they pay uh, $10 an hour or something like that to use the park, um, but there are also other groups that use the park and they have to pay substantially more. And I think the reason that residents are uh, um, experiencing it as a commercialisation, and that's why they they have used that word, and I've repeated it because that was the name of the petition. Um, but I can only um, think that they use the word commercialisation because um, the park is being used, uh, or this is what the petition says. Um, is that, and the concern is that it's been used at all times uh, of the day that it can possibly be used, and that um, it's uh, used to make money back to, in order to pay for the maintenance of the park. So this is one of the concerns um, that the residents have, and I believe that's why they've used the word commercialisation. Thank you, Councillor Werner. Councillor Sunak. Thank you. First, I'd like to ask a question um, of the General Manager. Are the fees and charges that we apply to this park any different to any of the other parks that we have in our local government area? And I think the answer will be no, because we have our fees and charges, and they're set in concrete, and we charge the same across the board. My concern is that because we've improved... I'm just, I'm just, I'm just being of assistance. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's always opportunities in the future. <laughs> Continue, Councillor. So, well, that, no, well, it's mainly for the people that are listening that they know that there's no special favours, there's no uh, additional benefits because you are a gardener park or anything like that. We charge the same across all parks. Now, in saying that, if we've improved the park and it's being overused and in some people's eyes or it's being overused because it's an improved facility, then us as a council, we need to revisit that. We need to look at it very closely. The mayor at the time said there'll be there'll be no additional use, which I can't answer for that. I'm not there every day. It just concerns me that if people get up and say that the park's used 315 days a year in a, in a soccer capacity, we can confirm that because we can go back to our records, our bookable system and say, okay, we've got this many this many bookings. If they're used outside of that, then we have to address that in a different way with Banksia Tigers. So commercialisation, I don't think that's the appropriate word. If there's a perception of overuse or exclusion of other activities, maybe we need to look at that and cast our eyes over that. Because if there's elderly people or people can't fly kites and people can't look at the fauna and fauna there, as, as we mentioned by some of the speakers, we need to address that because our first obligation is to the wider community. Our second obligation is to provide a park for, well, it's not an obligation, it's a thing we've done for many years, is to provide a park for the associations to utilise for, for, um, for sport, for, for match days, I'm trying to get the words out, for match days and for training for certain groups. They allocate the parks, we provide a, a facility, 
we maintain it to a certain point depending on which park it is because we have different arrangements here and there and then it's given out to the association to allocate where where and who uses what at what times if there's concerns over the lights not being closed at early enough or there's noise um, early in the morning or late at night at the other end of training or the other end of games we need to address that too because it's unfair residents have got to live in their street they've got to have quiet enjoyment as we call it um, and it's I think something that we can sort of something that's really tangible we can actually get a grasp of and and speak to the parties that are involved so I think it's something that's maybe come to a head now Gardner Park's been in operation for a little while um, it's something we need to address and it's coming to the fore. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sunas. Councillor Savanos. Madam Mayor, I intend to speak on this motion, but let's go through the notice of the motion that the residents have put up. Okay, one, exclude the median grass area at the northern end of the park from any bookings to allow informal passive recreation. I've gone there during the day and found nobody there other than people having their dogs unleashed. I've had residents complain to me that they're too scared to say anything because they're fearful of, um, of intimidation by Facebook. While I'm on my feed to Facebook, I want to say, my, say hello to those false uh, counts that are attacking me on a, on a, uh, that have attacked me in the past. I say good day to them. Have the guts to put your real name on there and call me so I can sue you for defamation. Um, or even have a cup of coffee. But let's move on the motions. Okay, the, kid, the area that's been used, are, as explained by the club, for the eight-year-olds. Okay, the parents work during the day, which means the fields are not being used. That area there is not being used for training. Starts at five o'clock. So during the day, they filled that area there, and I'm the one, I'm the one that got the, merit, the general manager to take the, the fences off so the community can use that facility. I'm the one, Meredith will recall, I actually said take the fences down so the community can use it. So during the day, that area there is not being used for, for soccer, for football. It's not been used. It's open to the general public. There's no, no fences, nothing there. Saturday and Sundays is the match games. These kids play football. They sport. They need a field. Now, in terms of number two, consult the local community about the landscape of the medium grass area, e.g. similar to Rockdale Park. I'm the one, two years ago, that moved the motion that we set up an advisory committee. I'm the one. I'm the one who had it. I'm the one who put it up first of all and said, and the general manager will know, will confirm it. No, check the records. I'm the one that moved it, and I'm the one was pushing for the advisory committee. That is one of the charts. See, she's not in council soon. She's not. The advisory committee was to look at landscaping area adjacent to the, the all, all the weather field. I'm the one. So this is still in the system. We've got the advisory committee looking at it. Number three, make promises to the local community. My understanding is that there is no increase in usage of the field. Now, for some other reason, Madam Mayor, I'm not afraid to speak out. It's not, it seems to be a them against us. Some of the speakers that spoke the other night and they're there, I raised with them two years ago and said, why don't we have a harmony day where the both communities get together and try and solve the issue and have a barbecue. One side said, no, we're not interested. Now we want to consult and, and be in harmony. We could have done that two years ago. This could have all been avoided. Could have all been avoided by Two groups getting together and having a barbecue called part of Harmony Day. Now, I stand here and I'm proud of those kids here that are playing football. They have achieved the highest goal in the state. We should all be proud of them. All these kids here. I commend you all for putting the dedication, the dedication to the sport. As the speaker said, Bankshire Tigers is not just about football. It's not about football. It teaches the kids to be better citizens. What do we want our kids to go out on the streets? They provide facilities and education for these kids. I've seen the videos where they go on camps. I'm proud of Bankshire Tigers. I'm very proud of them for what they have achieved. That park has been used, well, not, not just Bankshire Tigers, but a number of residents. Um, anyway, the residents, and I said before, they've contacted me. They live in fear of the unleashed dogs that, that go on that northern area. We don't seem to be doing anything about it. We have not resolved to have it as an unleashed area. Mothers and, mothers and kids are afraid to go to the park because there's supposedly a protest where they go and um, residents go around with their dogs and just let them out on the loose. There was a uh, complaint I had last year where one, one, one kid was uh, bitten on. 
I urge everybody to get together um, and let's all live in peace and harmony and let's all be proud of what Bankshire Tigers has achieved uh, on it. There is no way, no way, and I know this is what, what this is leading to, there is no way that Bankshire Tigers is going to walk away from Gardner's Park because, look, councillors, look at all these kids. What are we going to do, kick them out on the streets? No. I say to you kids, well done. Well done. Keep it up. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. I was reluctant to speak uh, at this uh, on this issue, but it's a burning desire um, to speak. First, I want to thank the speakers from both sides. Uh, full respect to the club being here and the Friends of Gardner Park being represented. I did, I did take a little bit of offence, though, to the second speaker who mentioned um, the angry men. Uh, I play soccer. And generally, I'm not an angry man, number one. Number two, I see all these beautiful people at the back and none of them look angry at all. So I think to tarnish the boys playing soccer or men playing soccer as angry men, um, as Councillor Hannah has pointed out to me in the past, it's quite offensive. And I think we need to take that stigma away from this soccer culture. But more importantly, I think what's going on here, let's be frank, there is an elephant in the room right now and let's all just put it out there on the table. This has nothing to do with commercialising of Gardner Park. Not one speaker really spoke about commercialising Gardner Park. First it was the fight against synthetic grass. Second it was the six metre fence. Third it was the signs on the fence. And now we have this concept of commercialising Gardner Park. And I'm very fearful to speak about this because I know, like Councillor Savranowski said, on Facebook we will be targeted for having an opinion one way or another. And because we don't believe in this concept, I'm going to be targeted. Councillor Savranowski is going to be targeted saying we're against A, B and C. But I think the truth needs to be told. This has nothing to do with this petition. Nothing. What we're talking about here, ladies and gentlemen, councillors, is all to do with synthetic fields. The fight has nothing to do with Banksia Tigers. It's to do with council. We made that decision, not them. And now they're being the targets. Everyone's attacking them. Why are we attacking a grassroots local club again and again and again? We attack them for the fence. We attack them for the synthetic field. We attack them for having players. Banksia has hundreds and hundreds of kids, as you've heard, volunteers. And I've seen for the first time, I can't believe how many women are playing soccer. So I applaud you. I applaud St. George Football Association. This is amazing. It's not about all these bearded men like myself. It's about seeing women playing sport, young kids playing sport. Because as you heard, if they're not playing sport, what else are they doing? And as a teacher, and I know a few of us have that teaching background, if you're not playing sport, what are we doing? And what's... <laughs> sport is a key to getting kids off the streets, out of trouble. You need to give them something to do. So let's not make this political. As you heard, I've been down to the park. I've played at the park myself. It doesn't have a fenced off area. You can walk down there. Councillors, you could walk down there. And for majority of the day, as Councillor Savanowski said, Monday to Sunday, there's so many opportunities for you to go and play and kick a ball and do what you have to do. The park is massive. This is what I believe we are looking for as a council. This club, this activity, this is what we want as a community. This is what we want as a society. Enough is enough. Let's be real. This is not about the club. It's all about the synthetic field. Or, as you heard from the second speaker, who represents the Natural Turf, what was it, Association? Alliance. So if we're going to be frank about this, let's put it all on the table. 
Because I think that's what we're not doing. Enough is enough. Let them play. Just let them play. I've got a few questions through you, Madam Mayor, if you don't mind, to the general manager. I note the petition. I note the emails that have come through. And this I've just written some notes down from the email from the petition. With respect to Councillor Werner, this is not attacking you. I have full respect for your position on this. Um, I asked this through the general manager, or sorry, through the mayor, um, to the general manager. In regards to this, to this perceived conflict of interest that Councillor Werner has, who has put this motion, has, she, has this been addressed, number one? Number two, uh, as, the, as the president of the club has mentioned, number one. Number two, um, is there a conflict of interest? Was this dealt with? And why does this keep coming up again and again and again? Are we dealing with the synthetic grass or are we dealing with Banksia tigers? Sorry. Thank you, Councillor Cedric. I'm going to have to call those questions, take those questions on those out of order in the current um, context, but um, thank you. Councillor Wada. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I will be speaking against the, the motion. Now, I'll, I'll be approaching this in a different manner. I've gone through the petition. I mean, some of the speakers, and I won't mention names, I mean, some of the speakers are, are, have been dealing with for the last three years. Now, with the petition, we've got addresses. Obviously, we can't, um, uh, you know, disclose names and so forth. We've got Walleye Creek, Rockdale and Cogra. I mean, the speaker was saying about how people have been deprived of using the park because of Banksia Tigers. Um, and the misuse of the park. Now, why would someone and, and multiple people living in Woolai Creek, why would someone living in Woolai Creek be signing a petition to play at Gardner Park, sorry, to use Gardner Park and Cogra, and they probably belong to Georgia's River Council, not even Bayside. So I think the bottom, the bottom line is um, this is definitely a uh, attack on the club rather than, than anything else. And I think uh, what Councillor Sunna said, yes, true, I did uh, make a statement that the usage would not be increased. And I stand by my words because the bottom line is, if you recall, the synthetic grass was simply put in to increase the usage, not because we're increasing the usage 24 hours, seven days a week, because some of the games were cancelled due to weather. But now with the synthetic, even when it's raining, and I've seen it at um, you know uh, at other parks where it rains and always surprised driving past, raining heavily, and they're still playing. If it was natural grass, they couldn't play. And I think I'll, I'll just touch uh, on so the petition you can't validate the petition, and as one of the speakers said, I would not take that into account whatsoever. I think with, with Gardner Park, it's been now four years. Same people complaining, and I, I would say, with all respect to Councillor Wuna, I'd be very careful bringing these notices of motion. I'm not going to down, uh, go down the track of uh, Councillor Wuna, which I, I respect the question. Now, being a part of Friends of Gardner Park two years ago, and you resign your position, it doesn't change your views. So to be on the safe side, she should never, ever be putting these motions to council and even be involved because she's going to lose credibility. And losing credibility, no one's going to listen. So I would say just let it go. We are trying. I mean, we had a problem years back before we started Rockdale Park, uh, sorry, Uncliffe Park, where we had a lot of problem with the young generation with drugs uh, being out of control, and we were addressing that. Now, with uh, Gardner Park, I mean, could you imagine the positivity that's coming out of that park with 600 families with their children using that park? I mean, having a petition coming with 332 signatures, but if you look at uh, Gardner Park, you've got maybe 40, 50 properties. Why is it we're getting people outside the area dictating what we do at council? I mean, what you've got to realise, if you go back two years ago, during my uh, mayoralty term, 
I mean, there were comments about we don't want to waste ratepayers' money because we're wasting ratepayers' money making the change and the ruining the heritage. But what they forgot that they've wasted close to a million dollars of council's money on their allegation, false allegation about what council. Land Environment Court has gone through it, threw it out of court. Then we had all the staff working, and I won't mention names, senior staff spend five days from 8.30 till 5 till they got home just answering questions that weren't even supposed to be coming into council, but it was uh, a duty that we had to do. So I, I think when, when you look at it, no matter who comes in here about Gardner Park, They've lost credibility. Losing credibility, the, the fact is it's vindictive. It's about fighting uh, Banksia Tigers and the people. And one of, one, even one of the speakers mentions it's specifically for one group of community members. I mean, what is that supposed to mean? I mean, we're talking about Natural Turf Alliance. Okay, we've got, we've got the chief scientist coming with a report. Why even waste your time and come here tonight before that report comes out? Let the report come out and let the report tell us that we have to remove all the synthetics. And they're not only targeting Bayside, it's around the whole city. I'm not quite sure how they get the time to do that. So let's wait for the chief scientist. If it's about the synthetic, we will pull it out. We'll put back natural turf. And that will apply for the whole of New South Wales. Now, you know, increasing uh, usage, as I said, it's about to do with the weather. Uh, we're lucky to have the synthetic, so uh, we get use out of it rather than, uh, you know, uh, losing half our gain. And who better person to come here tonight and explain it all about how friendly, other than Ari, for the chairperson and executive director. Coming from Ari, you could tell she has dealt with Banksia Tigers. She has dealt with all the other clubs. So I, I think tonight you've got to understand that we should be, I mean, friends of Gardner Park, whoever they name themselves now, I think you've got to accept the fact that the Land Environment Court in the park, the courts, uh, council staff, they've ticked all the boxes. Get over it. Get over it. And if you, if you wanted to really um, find out how you get together, ring uh, the Banks of Tigers, the President, the Secretary, get together and solve any issues you have a problem with. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Councillor White. Councillor Barlow. I'm just going to move, <coughs> if I can get a voice, um, a foreshadowed motion, which is that we receive a note for uh, petition that councils that be provided with an information session regarding usage of all our sporting grounds, because there seems to be a misinterpretation of what is used and how it's used. I mean, it goes through the whole cycle. Um, the council notes that providing opportunity for children to play sport is vital for communities. And then I've, as the chairperson of the Gardner <coughs> Park Reference Group, and that the Gardner Park Reference Group welcomes ideas for the park and feels feel free to notify the chair or your community representative. I've, we've had, I think, three meetings with the Garden Park Reference Group. There's some great ideas being, ideas being brought forward that have all got to be looked at. It's all got to be costed. But I have been down to that park and what amazed me tonight, every single speaker did not mention the huge open area at the top. It fascinated me. I didn't know it was there. Well, Councillor Hannah and I went down there with his dog, beautiful Shiloh, on a leash, and a lady turned up, let her dog off the leash, threw the ball, and we're standing there. I went, oh, it's not an off-leash dog area, but that was that grassed area. Shiloh stayed on his leash. Yes. I'm not sure if you recorded this meeting. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter because it's on. It's recorded anyway. The, the door should, I don't know. Well, legally, you can't. I mean, it's recorded anyway, and they can go back and listen to it at any time. Oh, 
continue. Thank you, Councillor Barlow. Please continue. Anyway, um, yeah, I've forgotten where I was. But that, and so I've, we've been down there. Shiloh was on his leash, so her, her, sorry, hers, sorry. Um, so we have an issue of off-leash dogs. There's a great area at the top, which no one here mentioned, and no one seems to talk about it. It is quite a, it's a huge area. So all I'm saying is that as a chairperson of the Ghana Park Reference Group, the idea should be coming to us, not just through a petition, and we can all talk at it, about it there. And can I just um, pause you for a moment, please, Councillor Barlow? I just want to remind members of the public that no recordings can be undertaken. There is only the official recording, which is recorded by council. So if anyone has recorded anything, you need to delete that immediately because that is a breach of the Privacy Act. So um, please do so if you have. And um, I don't want to see any of that. Uh, the only recording I want to see is the official recording, which is on YouTube. I make that very clear. I do not want to see any other recordings or we will have to take legal proceedings. Thank you, Councillor Barlow. <coughs> so it's actually, it's all been said, and I do believe that the children, they need that grassed area. It doesn't need to have trees there. There's plenty of shrubbery around. And so that I'm quite happy that everyone else has spoken and we've all supported the fact that it's an area that needs children to play there. The cricket... The Nepalese cricket people were not a member of the St George Association, so they used that park illegally. They didn't. They had to become a member, so before they could use it officially. So there's still areas where they can play, and I just say to everyone, there's this lovely grassed area up the top, and everyone could play, play up there. And we're looking at it. Thank you, Councillor Barlow. <laughs> Um, so just to flag, um, we have a, a mover and seconder for the orchard motion as on the screen, but at the moment we are still dealing with the original motion. Did you want to count some musket? Thank you, um, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge I've had a great involvement with sports. Um, unfortunately, soccer wasn't one of them because my four girls at the time weren't interested in soccer, but um, I'm a great advocate of voluntary um, running of different sporting groups and I think we need to seek a balance and I come back to the mayoral's minute of tonight of improving customer experience at Bayside and I feel that we need to listen to all our Bayside community but we need to look at how we can balance sport with the, uh, the rest of the community. We need to maybe hand this over to our new committee that's looking at the customer experience. But I believe that we need to have a, a space and a time and a place for every kind of sport, for every public activity, and we need to be in harmony with each other. And I have to say that's something I've been very proud of being a Bayside member. And I think it's vital that sport is an active part of our society and our lifestyles. So I would like to see our mayoral minute reflect um, how Bayside addresses um, the fairness between whatever sporting club it can be, that we all are given equality in our areas and our facilities. So that's mine. Thank you, Councillor Musket. Um, before we have a right of reply, are there any further speakers? Councillor Douglas. Uh, I, I second your... Uh, uh, idea around unity and peace here and I find it very upsetting to hear this kind of vindictiveness that is being that those sorts of words being used even by councillors as well because I think there's a, been obviously a lot of history and a lot of emotion uh, behind this issue and really we do need to come together as a community and solve this. Um, what I would also say is that some of the ideas being presented tonight aren't actually new. They were in the minutes from the last City Services Committee around the Gardner Park Reference Group, like requests asking for a dog exercise area, a request for the balanced use of the park, um, including the use of the natural turf field, 
to be open use rather than bookable space. This has been before the Gardner Park reference group, and I, I trust uh, that that group, you know, is addressing some of these issues. Um, I would like to ask a question of the chair of the Gardner Park reference group, if that's okay, Madam Mayor. I think we've got to stay focused on on just, what's just, before just us. What was raised earlier tonight was a request from a community member for an acoustic report, traffic report, and usage report. There are three things that could go before the Gardner Park Reference Group to start to try and address and un unpack some of these issues that are plaguing the community there. I think if you look at the foreshadowed motion, um, there's a point there that says that councillors be provided with an information session regarding usage of all sporting grounds. So that's something that could be considered as part of that. Okay, excellent. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Douglas. Um, no further speakers. Um, Councillor Werner, would you like a right of reply? Thank you. Um, so first of all, I would like to say that it, it, um, I agree it is really important to bring unity and peace to um, the Bayside community. And I would like to say that this is not about the Bunchy of Tigers, and it's not even about soccer. It's actually about a petition uh, that was signed by 92 of 92 percent of people who live directly near the park, and it's not people from Willi Creek. I think someone might have made a mistake there. It's Willi Creek Road. So Willi Creek Road actually goes um, uh, right adjacent is adjacent to Gardner Park, and um, so the people who signed signed it, some of them uh, were living on Willi Creek Road. So I just had a very quick look through the petition and I couldn't see any signatures from people who lived in Willi Creek. I saw two signatures from people who lived in Cogra, but apart from that, it was all people who live directly next to the park as far as I could see. So what this shows is that there is um, a lot of concern from the people living directly next to the park, and that was, you know, 332 people signed that petition, and um, and it's an extremely high rate of um, people signing that petition, and um, I think it is very important that council notes these concerns and that we can come to a balanced uh, a balance whereby. You know, everyone makes a little bit of a compromise. And of course, we don't want to get rid of soccer. We don't want to get rid of Banksia Tigers from the park. This petition does not ask for that. It simply says that the usage, um, that there are no changes to the usage. So obviously before the, um, the changes were made to the park, um, the you know the clubs were were already using it then and and uh, the petition is not asking for for that to to change. It's just that the the petition is asking um, that the usage be brought back to what it was before. Um, so the other thing is uh, that um, there are other fields in Bayside, and so I believe that. Uh, we could find uh, a balance, and that that um, you know some of the users could uh, maybe use other fields in Bayside as well. And so, if if the if the usage was spread more across um, the fields that Bayside does have, um, then that could be one of the solutions. But that's not even what this motion is about. So, this motion is about the petition that was brought by residents that live around the field. Um, so, um, I, and I believe it's really important for council to, to note those concerns. Thank you, Council Werner. So we have a, um, a motion by Council Werner in front of us, and then we have a foreshadowed motion. So we will deal with the original motion by Councillor Werner. Um, which is on the screen in front of you. So all those in favour say aye. Against, I declare the motion lost. This now takes us to the foreshadowed motion. So the fo 
for shadowed motion is on the screen. We have a mover and a seconder. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against. I declare the I declare them we can have a division. Um, I declare the motion carried, but we will have a division. So this is in relation to the foreshadowed motion. So um, Councillor Musket, Councillor Fadell, Councillor Jansen, Councillor Saranoski, Councillor Sunis, Councillor Werner. Oh, sorry, I'm going too quick. So you can keep going all the way to Councillor Sunis. Excellent. Councillor Werner, Councillor Wada, Councillor Barlow, Councillor Hannah, Councillor Douglas, Councillor McDougall, Councillor Cedrat. Myself is for. I declare it unanimously carried. Thank you very much. I'm going to um, thank you for everyone that attended and spoke. I'm going to um, take a five minute recess for councillors um, to have a break and allow. Uh, everyone's welcome to stay, but if you would like to um, go home, um, we'll just turn.
Okay, thank you, councillors. Um, we resume the meeting again at 9.02 p.m. So the next item on the agenda where we have the final um, public forum speaker um, is 12.2, the Notice of Motion Gambling Harm Minimisation. Um, I will vacate the chair as I have put forward a significant non-pecuniary interest. As I vacate the chair and in the absence of the Deputy Mayor, Council's Code of Meeting, Pro Meeting Practice requires those councillors present to elect a chair for this item. I hand you over to the General Manager who will manage the election process. Thank you, councillors. Almost. <clears throat> Prior to calling for nominations, I'm going to outline the procedure because this is quite rare. We don't do this very frequently. If there's only one nomination, that councillor will be elected as chair for this particular item. If there's more than one councillor, voting will be by show of hands. Each councillor will be entitled to one vote and the councillor with the highest number of votes um, obviously will be elected as chair. In the case where two or more candidates receive the same number of votes, the chairperson will be the candidate. The chairperson is to be the candidate whose name is chosen by lot. In other words, Bowstow has brought along the ballot box and will be drawing it out of the hat. So, on that basis, I will now call for nominations for chairperson. Councillor Wada, do you accept the nomination? No. Councillor McDougall, you've been nominated. Do you accept the nomination? Are there any other nominations? <laughs> On that basis, Councillor McDougall, would you like to assume the chair? Uh, thank you, councillors. Um, now move to item 12.2, Notice of Motion Gambling Harm Minimisation. I believe we have one speaker in the public forum, Ms Tracy Ewan. Ms Ewan. Good evening, councillors, and thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak tonight. I'm here speaking in support of this motion to minimise ga gambling harm, and that involves telling you a bit about my story, a story that I rarely share in private, let alone in public. But I feel now is the right time, while we have the momentum and a rare opportunity to create change on this issue, both in this council and in the state. My mother had a gambling problem. When I was four, we moved to the Gold Coast from Sydney and ended up living near Conrad Jupiter's casino. My mum told me that she worked there and by work, she played blackjack and counted cards at night. I spent a lot of my early childhood playing pa with paper planes in the foyer of that casino. When we walked in, my mum would walk me past the gaming entrance, point out the pokies and say, look, look at those idiots. You can't win with pokies. You only play those to lose. Not like me, I play blackjack where you can win by counting cards. When I was 12, we moved to a quieter suburb and that meant our home was too far for my mum to regularly go to the casino anymore. Instead, she played a bit of bingo, a bit of keno, but somehow along that slippery slope, she ended up on the pokies herself. The same idiot machines that she had warned me from. And I can only assume it, assume it was because they were so accessible being at every RSL, bowls, and sports club in the area. Anytime we played bingo, you could see them across the room, even at the bar at the top of our local shopping centre. So that's where she ended up, and that became her life, her hobby, and her social scene. Luckily, the venues closed at earlier hours back then, usually at 10 p.m., not like the 4 a.m. ones here, or she would have stayed out all night. My childhood was tumultuous, and I mostly raised myself alone. 
We never had birthdays, excursions, Christmases, or anything that involves spending extra money. Instead, that would go into the machine. When she won, she'd come home with a big bag of groceries, and when she lost, it was a trigger for her anger and her drinking. But at least she came home at night, and her losses were capped, because eventually we had no more money to lose. Instead, I'd lost my mother, and she'd lost herself. But what I came to tell you, though, is that even though my mother was a ferociously strong woman who survived post-war China, migrated across the world, and made an empire for herself in business and property, she also couldn't stop herself once the pokies took hold. The only things that stopped her were the things outside of her control. That venues had early closing hours or were too far to get to, or her losses were capped when she ran out of money. And for people with gambling addiction, this is why harm minimization controls and safeguards need to be put in place because they can't control themselves to stop otherwise. It's a complete shame that our society and government have allowed pokies to infiltrate and rot our communities from the inside out. To let something so destructive become ubiquitous in places that we gather and we socialize, often clubs and hotels that are also child friendly. Now pubs and clubs are wonderful centers for our communities, but pokies do not have a place there. Keep them in casinos and out of our local pubs. If a pub or club has a reliance on gambling revenue for its survival, it has a broken business model. As members of local government put here to care for our people, you cannot condone their profiting from human suffering. So as Bayside Council, please show that you demand action and let's hope that the next state government will follow suit. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Yuan. Uh, councillors, there's a motion before us. Do we have a mover and a seconder? Move Councillor Werner. Seconded Councillor Douglas. Councillor Werner. Yep. Thank you. So, gambling harm, harm minimisation experts and the New South Wales Crime Commission say that the only way to reduce harm from gambling habits and organised crime is to introduce a mandatory cashless gaming card. The one card would have built-in harm reductions like restrictions on losses and hours played, traceable expenditure, universal to all va venues, and linked to a statewide exclusion register. Currently, people seeking to control their gambling habit must register venue by venue and then rely on staff in each venue to recognise them and to deny them entry. So I just wanted to point out some statistics that are um, specifically for Bayside. So we have, um, and this is from the Liquor and Gaming New South Wales website, um, we have uh, a net profit, so that's a loss from our residents of nearly $49 million, uh, and that's only from January 2022 to June 2022. The number of machines in only in hotels is 428 in 15 hotels. Now, for the clubs, um, their net profit, which means a loss to residents, is more than four, 35 million, and that's only for half the year. So, and also the number of machines are 1,072 across 18 premises. So the total number of machines in Bayside is 1,500. And I've estimated the losses per year um, based on uh, the average takings from clubs, uh, from each machine and clubs and hotels are slightly different. But the total amount is nearly $136 million lost by Bayside residents every single year. And this is money that many people who gamble and their families, don't forget it's their families who suffer too, cannot afford to lose. Another concern is that poker machines are being used for money laundering. Now, an investigation by New South Wales Crime Commission into money laundering via poker machines found that billions of dollars of annual 
electronic gambling machine turnover was probably the proceeds of crime. According to the Crime Commission, this involves people putting cash into a machine and then immediately cashing it out while playing few or no games. Revenue per poker machine has been on the rise generally in New South Wales, and this means losses for people who gamble. Um, so for clubs, the average profit generated by each machine climbed from, oh no, the, well, these are New South Wales wide uh, figures, and they're pretty shocking as well. So um, the inquiry by the um, New South Wales Crime Commission found that a significant amount of money which is put through poker machines, um, yeah, they assessed it was in the billions of dollars. So as the inquiry's lead agency used special powers entrusted to it to conduct coercive hearings with criminals and their associates as part of extensive criminal investigations. And in addition, the inquiry analysed and matched large data sets across law enforcement, regulatory and intelligence holdings, interviewed industry stakeholders, staff and venues and other experts, and, um, and undertook this analysis, uh, an analysis of judicial decisions. Electronic gambling machines, which are the pokies, constitute a money laundering risk because they primarily accept cash and because cash continues to be the primary method by which criminals obtain wealth from dealing in illicit commodities. Now, one of our clubs has 237 poker machines. If these machines make the average amount per machine, then people who gamble at that club are losing around six, over $16 million a year. Five of our clubs have 95 or more poker machines. Data available from the Department of Enterprise, Investment and Trade website shows that Bayside has five hotels in the top 100 for gaming machine net profit, which is a loss, obviously, to gamblers. And that's out of 1,232 hotels. So basically, getting to the motion, this motion asks that we send a letter to um, the Premier and the Leader of the Opposition calling for a number of um, harm minimisation measures. So you can see them on the screen there. And also that Council commits to applying to the Office for Responsible Gaming, Gaming for at least one grant a year for harm minimisation, um, a project designed in consultation with the Bayside community. Also that Council holds an annual Gambling Harm Minimisation Roundtable open to the public, one focus of which is to develop a community education and awareness campaign regarding gambling harm minimisation. And also that Council commends all pubs and clubs in Bayside that are proudly pokies free. Thank you. Councillor Lerner, are there any other speakers? Councillor Saravanovsky. Uh, thank you, Mr. Oh, yeah. Quickly for my um, I thank um, Tracy for her speech. It's very touching um, um, on it. Uh, what she said. It's I know for a fact it's hard when someone has um, the blood of gambling in their in their system. Um, in my previous position in the bank, my role was state credit manager, and I dealt with a lot of issues. And the, one of the biggest uh, issues for us was gambling. Um, and the, the, the addiction. The issue that I've got at the moment, Madam uh, Mr. Mayor, is in relation to this notice of motion um, at the moment. It's a knee jerk reaction. We've got an election one month away. And I thank Tracy and I wish you all the best for the green seat for the seat of Cogra. I wish you all the best. But what we have to do is, and I've been following the media since this matter came about, it's not just came about the last two months, three months. This has been going from a number of years, a, a number of years, in terms of the gambling situation. Um, every day, there's changes to the policy. Now, I'm not going to be political, but I will be. 
The Liberal, the Labor Party, Mr Minns, has quite clearly said, which is the most common sense, and that is we put it on trial. There is no technology at the moment to have ca a cash cardless, a cash, ca uh, cash, um, cash uh, card, cashless card. There is no technology at all. There is none. So, and then um, he said, do a trial in partnership with the clubs and the pubs, because I'm not a, I'm not a public for the clubs. As I said, I've declared the thing, but one thing that's impressed me over the years is the community contributions at the clubs, and they're all non-profit, except the pubs, they're all non-profit um, clubs. They go, give back into the community uh, financial assistance for a lot of projects. There's a lot of projects. So you can't wipe an industry of, that employs over 70,000 people. But what I've been going back to, what I'm saying, I, I was listening to the Premier for another month, keeps changing the rules as he goes along. And he says, we'll have these cards and the gambler will pick their limit every day. How are you going to do that? This, this is policy on the run. Uh, Mr Acting uh, Mayor, it's policy on the run. It is a very serious thing. We shouldn't be politicising this one month before the state election um, and getting on the bag bank and saying, oh, this is what we should do. It's, it's outrageous. It is outrageous. But we've got to make sure that we implement a policy uh, that is effective from tomorrow not something in five years' time that's going to come into to place. We need to also speak to the clubs and the pubs and in partnership with the state government because at the end of the day, we're not going to make the call. This is the call from the state government. Whoever wins, and hopefully it will be Labor, will win it in March. They're the ones who are going to make the call. They're going to balance it all out. Now, um, that's why we've got state governments in there. I am concerned in terms of the high level of debt um, on it. I'll just give you three cases um, that I've come across here in my life. One is a very good friend of mine. He was gambling at the casino. There's no mention about the casino. There is more money laundering in the casino um, around. There's no, con no, no one suggesting we put controls at the casino. Uh, Albert hung himself because he ran up a, de a debt of $6 million at the casino. $6 million. I've got a friend of mine who won Lotto. I won't give you the amount. He went bankrupt. And the reason why he went bankrupt was online gambling. No mention about online gambling here. That's the silent killer um, on it. And another one lost 350000 in one night. In one night, he lost it to the casino. Madam, um, sorry for the amount. Keep calling me, madam. But <laughs> what we should do is... Uh, yeah, I'm actually going to it this weekend. Um, what we should do uh, is note, and I'm going to push out a amendment uh, motion, that is we note that, the, um, that it's a state government responsibility and as, a, as in due course um, we wait, to the, wait for the outcome of the state election um, and then we find out exactly what the policies are of uh, the Labor Minsk government um, and um, find out what their policy is and then make representations um, in terms of how we can make life a better place for our community. That's very important. Now, the way to go about it after it is, is my suggestion, is that we ne need to go through the local government association. Because I can assure you, one letter from Bayside Council to the Minister is going to make no difference. The power is with our local government association. That's why we're affiliated to the local government association. So I would say that you know maybe one month, two months after the state election, we can make inquiries uh, with the Minns Labor government uh, where the general manager um, will, will be, do an information session. And Mr Minns's office is only around the corner and then we can, then we can find out exactly, exactly what the, the government's position is on that. And I also wanted to note that we must also acknowledge that the clubs, if we can add that as a, um, one of the points, of their co contribution to the local community in terms of funding and employment, hmm? and employment. And employment if we can. Councillor Taranowski, seconded Councillor Jansen. Because if we shut the door on this, um, and can I say, I, when I did my declaration, I do go to the clubs, but I will never part with my cash on a machine because it's called self-control. And for my birthday the other night, I was at St George Lee's Club. And I can honestly say, hand on heart, I do not gamble. I'm not a gambler. I, I don't drink alcohol and I don't gamble. So, 
even on the, I don't even know how to gamble on the horse races on Melbourne Cup. I have to get Meredith to pick the horses for me. So. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Councillor Saranovsky. Are there any further speakers, Councillor Sedrak? Um, thank you, Mr. Acting Mayor, Handsome Man. Um, can I just commend the lady that spoke, Miss Ying? Um, my heart goes out to her and her family. I can't believe her coming here and speaking. Um, I could definitely see her emotion and even holding back the tears. I wholeheartedly agree um, against. I'm wholeheartedly um, against the concept of pokies, gambling. Um, I think it's a devastating issue for all families, society, the community. It's one of those evils in our society um, that we see again and again. And I commend Councillor Werner for putting this up. Um, and I see, without a doubt that this is the future, that gambling in our state and across Australia and maybe across the world is going to change and we could see that happening quite, quite sooner than later. But in saying all that, um, this is a state issue and we've, it's quite clear uh, from what Councillor Savranoski said and I've spoken to some of the, um, our members um, in the state, and both sides of the party, uh, sorry, all political parties, um, all political parties generally are moving towards removing these pokies, putting real tough stance on this addiction. We know it's going to happen. Even the clubs, when you talk to them and you go and visit them, they know it's coming. Now, whether it happens in five years or ten years, it's, it's, the writing's on the wall. Things will change. And so I, I know this is the case, but I think what's important here and we need to lose, not lose focus of is we are Bayside Council and this is not a council issue. And what I'm finding again and again and what I'm seeing is that we're mixing up state and federal issues in council. And it might be good in front of the public domain and on Facebook and social media that we are against all these things. However, I think what we need to be looking at, it's been said, and said again and again, is the real issues that are taking place here in Bayside, which is the parking, which is the rubbish, and all, all that kind of stuff. So that's my first point. Second point is that um, as much as I respect this motion and what Councillor Werner is trying to achieve, I don't know the pros and cons of what this means to our clubs. I don't know what it means to our sporting facilities and sporting uh, clubs that are benefiting from um, clubs like Brighton, Brighton RSL, who I know donate a lot of their money to a lot of charities as well as cl local clubs. What does that mean? What does that translate to? Um, I know they do a lot of uh, donations to local schools. Some of the libraries and some of the books that are in the library are because of our RSL clubs. Now, again, I'm just making clear, I'm against gambling wholeheartedly, so like S Councillor Savanoski. However, I think there's a, we need to see the whole picture in its entirety, and this does not allow that. As a council, I think what we need to be careful on, if we pass these kind of motions, then we're taking, we, we, we're sitting, and I don't want to use a neighbouring council, we, we become like that inner west council where Every state issue, whether it be, I don't want to go into all those political issues now, but I think what we need to focus on is the core, core issue of council is about, and I don't see this to be the one. This is a state issue. If the state pass it next year when Chris Minns potentially will get in, more than likely, if Chris Minns gets in and Labor take over and he changes and he says, you know what, we're getting rid of all the pokies, then okay, we've got to stand by that, and we will. However, at the moment, this is not a council issue. So I um, am against the motion and I support the forward shadowed motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sedrak. Are there any further speakers? Councillor Barlow. I have to say I'm surprised I even agree with my fellow colleague here. Oh. Oh. 
Don't fall over. Oh, this is amazing. So, sorry, can you can you repeat Wait, that for me, the recording, <laughs> Councillor Barlow? But yeah, it, it's and it's disappointing, and we're getting so many state issues. This is actually nearly a a, a copy of um, Inner West one. Okay, this was valid before Christmas. Since then, the base. Both um, Labor and Liberal have come out with some sort of poker machine stuff. So we can't. It's sort of been redundant because of the two state mem the two the me premier and the uh, well, the opposition leader coming out with a policy or some sort of policy. So it really is a little bit late now. And I, yes, I agree that poker machines. It's an addiction. Um, I must admit that. Uh, I think it was 1974 at Balmain Leagues Club. We had visitors from Adelaide who had never seen a poker machine, and it had they had arms in those days. And the best part of the whole show was we saw Johnny O'Keefe live <laughs> singing Mockingbird. It was legless. Um, no, it wasn't legless. He was amazing, but the. So what I'm saying is, I, last time I think I played a poker machine. I didn't even understand it then, but um, it is an addiction. I do feel sorry for people that um, have no control. Um, I mean, everyone has some sort of a, maybe an addictive personality somewhere along the line. I have an addiction to buying wool. I went to Spotlight the other day and I went, oh, I shouldn't have bought that. But anyway, so I feel sorry and thank the speaker and I, it is concerning and I've haven't really known a lot of families that have had a problem with that, but there's everyone has addictions. It could be drug, it could be smoking, it could be other things. So this one does destroy a family quicker that, and their livelihood and their existence. So at the moment, I can't support, to me, the motion is now redundant. And until the, whoever's going to be in state parliament in whenever it is, it a month, isn't it, or something like that, um, we can listen then, but we aren't the decision maker. We can't go and say, we want this, we want that. It is not our decision. It is the state government decision. It is not ours. We can support it, but we, we aren't the decision maker. So I'm happy to support the foreshadowed motion just so that we've got something on record. And I believe that this the motion itself is redundant. Thank you, Councillor Barlow. Are there any... Further speakers, <laughs> Council Douglas. Um, <clears throat> I think the issue around what's a state government issue and what's a council issue and what's a federal government issue should be aired a bit more in this council at some point. I mean, we've we've signed on to a campaign to support the Uluru Statement from the heart. That is a federal issue. I've raised this before. It's deeply close to my heart, but it is a federal issue, and we're supporting it as council. We had a domestic violence rally last year, which was very well attended and really made something visible in the community that hadn't been made visible before and was really something I was very proud to be involved with. And it's not necessarily our legislative place to change the rules around domestic violence either, but we can make these issues visible to our community. We are the representatives of our community and we are the closest form of government to our community. So if we don't say something, if we don't air these concerns, then it's, a, it's another step away. People have a already have a big suspicion about politicians and they call us politicians. I don't consider us politicians, we're members of our community. So we can have that two-way dialogue that I think state and federal don't get that chance to. So I would like to say that actually don't, I don't think this is just a state government issue. This is a local community issue. And point two, three and four that were there specifically address the ways that council could get involved with this. They, they're not de dependent on the state government at all. They're saying, here's a community program that we can run in Bayside, like the domestic violence campaign last year, that we can do something here in our community to raise this issue and make it visible. And so I think even if we go with uh, the foreshadowed motion, we need to address and include points two, three, and four in that foreshadowed motion, because that's the local activism that Councillor Werner is proposing. Um, I'd also like to say that you know, we've talked about gender violence. In the notes that Council Werner gave us, it was really clear about how much gambling contributes to gender-driven violence, and in particular, the economic abuse of women. 
And I have personal stories now. My grandmother had a husband who would go and spend paycheck on a Friday down at the pub gambling. On the day he died, he stopped off and played, went to, did some gambling on the races. He had a couple of quick cold beers in the afternoon secretly and then got to the caravan park where they were on holidays and had a massive heart attack. My grandmother didn't know that he'd been off doing that in the few moments that were left at the end of his life. I have another very close family member who found out that her husband had a very bad gambling problem and had actually been siphoning off a portion of his wage. He was a bookkeeper. He was able to do that. She didn't know that he was had a, such a problem that he was lying to her and she never knew why they didn't have enough money. That whole family has fallen apart. The daughter now is having issues around, you know, what you know, the, the, the broken family. That was all because of gambling, because his inability to talk about it, his inability to air it, the shame that he'd had. And they live in a small regional community. I feel like if they'd had a council that had aired that, that potentially there would have been more opportunity in that community for her to talk about it, for him to talk about it, to normalise it in their community. So I really would like um, Councillor Sarah Vanoski now to consider adding point two, three and four, please, to the shadowed, the foreshadowed motion. Uh, Councillor Jansen. Look, I, I don't think we can add some of those um, points because just looking at point two, for example, um, that particular uh, funding line, I'm aware of those funding lines, that's for matching funding. So I don't know how we can um, commit to that um, as part of a notice of motion and council, local governments are not eligible for all of those categories. They're only eligible for to submit one grant each annual year when that, those um, grants are open and they're for matching grants. So I don't think like there's, there's a bit more background to this, so I don't think that personally, I don't believe that point two is quite accurate. Thanks, Councillor Jansen. Are there any further speakers? Councillor Sunas. Thank you, Mr Chair. Look, we've been hearing a lot of things tonight, and, and my concern is that we're treading into the areas that we shouldn't be dealing with, okay? We are part of the community. We should be conciliatory in, in things that people do, but if, if gambling is a problem, Let's stop gambling. Make, pull it away. We, we're a society that hurts itself. We sell cigarettes so we can collect revenue, and on the pack we write smoking kills. And then we let people buy it. And then we let them into the hospital because they've got emphysema. So we're hurting ourselves. So if there's a problem with gambling, why aren't we lobbying the government at a higher level, voting on election days, things like that, and saying, stop the poking machines altogether. But... As soon as you stop the poking machines, stop the hoons. You move them from this street, and then they'll end up on that street. They'll end up at the at the pub doing something else. We've got a we've got a, an institution called the TAB that takes everybody's money. So, there's a, if you want to gamble, there's an opportunity to gamble. We can talk until this building collapses. Um, people will gamble because it's their inner inner workings, and we can have these things. We could do these things as a as a group, but we're missing our responsibilities as a starting point as a council, and we spoke about this at our session a few weeks ago on that Saturday, we need to provide the basics. We need to provide the clean streets. We need to pick up the rubbish when it needs to go. We need to, we need to have our drains clean and tidy. We need to have all the footpaths in place, Mr Director. We need to have everything happening, and then we can go and do all the other things that we like to do. And all that costs money. Everything we speak about costs money. It's not free. To do number number one or number two, you need to have staff sit around, formulate formulate some sort of um, programs, sit down and talk to the community. We can do that. It's a possibility. But we've got so much other work to do that's in our backyard, which is for us to do, yet we're losing sight of it. Okay, we lobby the state government to stop the hooning. Okay, we've gone out of our way to do things. Yet the hooning continues, and I'm not picking on the hooning and looking at you, I'm just saying, as an example, right? And it's a thing we can't fix. We can talk about it till we're blue in the face. Legislation has to change, more policing has to come, whatever it is has to happen for that part of 
our problem to be solved. And it's similar with gambling. And, and, and I've noticed in the past few weeks or past few months, this council's been talking about state issues, constantly about state issues. Okay, if we've got time to talk about it, look, it's almost 10 o'clock and we're still talking about state issues. So my view is uh, I support the uh, foreshadowed motion. We can't be the fix-all for the state government. We could be uh, a lever and say to them, this is our opinion, this is our view, we've listened to our community, this is what we can offer. And then once they get in, they can put the brakes on what needs to be put. If it's a real problem, if if it's a problem of money being put in the machine like there's no tomorrow through through the pokies, and yet we're ignoring the casino and other other methods of putting money in, because I can't see someone putting in $100 notes. How many, how many could you put in to get to the billions? I don't understand it. As a, a logical person, it's, it's very strange. Um, but we need to say to them, send the message out, reduce the machines, but we can't do that. As soon as you say to the, the clubs in Rockdale or in our LGA, you need to shut at this time, they'll be at the Land Environment Court before we, before we, our meeting's over on a Wednesday night. They'll say, hang on a minute, why are we different to everyone else in the wider community? So we've got to stop focusing on state issues and get back to our basics. Mr Acting Chair, is that two for and two against by now? I think there have been two speakers for and two against. I um, have a right of reply. Do we get a right of reply if the motion is put? Right. Get right of reply, Councillor Werner. Thank you. So I would just like to say um, and remind everyone we do send letters to our MPs on state issues. You guys have done it before Heidi and I were even on council. We do it all the time. To say that, oh no, this is a state issue and therefore we're not going to write a letter, I think is very bad form. Um, the next thing is, the things we, that I've proposed that we put in that letter are based on research by Wesley Mission and the New South Wales Crime Commission. So these are really well thought out um, items that I think we really need to support, regardless of which uh, major party is in power after the next election, because it's going to be the same issues. It's going to be the same um, items that we need to call for um, on behalf of our residents and Bayside Council. So kicking the can down the road and saying, oh no, we should wait and see what happens and who's going to be in government and to see what they want to do, I think is actually letting down our residents. It's letting our residents down because, you know, you guys are asking for us to just, oh, wait and see what the next government wants. That's not what this motion is asking. This motion is asking for us to stand up for our residents and send a letter. And that doesn't require a lot of resources to send a letter to our MPs. The next thing is with, with the things on, on uh, at item two and three, okay, well, look, if, if those grants require a matching uh, by council, matching amount, then why don't we put that in the um, in that number two to say that council, instead of council commits to applying, council considers applying. And then that um, gives us some uh, an opportunity to look at what the costs are and then we can have a look at that later. So um, I would like to uh, propose an amendment to say that council considers applying to the Office of um, Responsible Gambling, and then that, that can deal with that issue. And thanks for bringing that up, Councillor Jensen. Um, but I think the other things still stand. I think it, it, it would be lovely for council to commend the pubs and clubs in Bayside that are proudly pokies free, and there are some, and I've been there, and they're, and they're wonderful um, clubs, such as the um, Club Arncliffe on Wollongong Road. Um, they don't have any pokies in there. So, um, again, I would like to encourage everyone to support this motion. Uh, thank, thank you, Councillor Werner. Put the motion. All those in favour? All those against? Declare that lost. A division? Sure.
have a division, please. Yeah, I'm sure there's a second there. Uh, Councillor Musket. Same. Uh, Councillor Fardell. Councillor Jansen. Councillor Saranovsky. Councillor Sunas. Councillor Werner. Councillor Wada. Councillor Barlow. Councillor Hanna. Councillor Douglas. Councillor Sedrak. And I'm against. I declare the motion lost. Move to the foreshadowed motion. Are there any speakers? No, put the motion. Uh, Councillor Jansen. Can I just say that if we, it's, I, I support Saravanovsky's um, foreshadowed motion because if we, if we write to um, state members now, the timing does need to be considered because they're prorogued from a particular date before the election. They can't do anything. They can't reply. Um, <coughs> or I think it's from next week, they cannot do anything. So the timing does matter here. Thank you, Councillor Jansen. Are there any further speakers? Councillor Saranovsky, write a reply. All those in favour? <laughs> All those in favour of the foreshadowed motion? All those against? Declare that carried. Have a division, please. Councillor Musket, Councillor Fardell, Councillor Jansen, Councillor Saravanovsky, Councillor Sunas, Councillor Werner, Councillor Wada, Councillor Barlow, Councillor Hanna, Councillor Douglas, Councillor Sedrak. And I'm for. Declare the motion carried. Um, and with that, I invite <laughs> Councillor. What, sorry? No, oh, sorry. The foreshadowed motion becomes a motion to put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. All those against? <laughs> Councillor Werner, declare the motion carried. Would you like one more division? No. All right. Uh, with that, I am... When the motion was lost. We just... Councillor Barlow wanted to vote again. She was very emphatic on the, her first time agreeing with Councillor Sedrak during this term. Um, uh, Invite Councillor uh, Mayor Curry to return to the chamber. Well With that, and vacate the chair. I think I'm all right, thank you. We find Councillor Curry. Thank you, Councillor McDougall. All right, that brings us back to the agenda. So we are back on item, first item, 10.1. <laughs> um, so we have a, a motion in front of us. Do I have a mover? Move Councillor Barlow, second Councillor Sunis. Do you want to speak, Councillor Barlow? Just to note that um, congratulate the staff and the information session we had and how it, how detailed it was and it was if you weren't it was worth anyone being there because it was so complex the situation we have there and I think I just wanted to congratulate the staff. Thank you, Councillor Barlow. Um, no further speakers. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against declare it carried. Um, Ten point two. Um, the general manager has to leave the meeting. <laughs> um, who would like to act? <laughs> okay, um, do I have a mover? Moved Councillor Jansen, seconded Councillor Sedrak. Any speakers? Um, I'd just like to add to the um, recommendation that um, councillors, uh, because of the early payment, that councillors receive a um, business plan um, by July 2023, I think it's said. And this is because I think this is a great initiative. I'd like to know a little bit more about the Business Enterprise Centre and um, 
their outcomes and how we can sort of leverage off their key outcomes for our community. That's why I'd be interested in um, seeing a business plan that comes along with that um, funding agreement. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Happy to accept that. Yep. Okay. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against, declare it carried. Um, could you please invite the general manager to return? I did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, that takes us to 10.4. I'll just wait for the general manager, sorry, because. <laughs> Quick meeting's a good meeting. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, so I have a move, 10 point four move. Councillor Hannah seconded. Second. Councillor Barlow, sorry. Um, Councillor Hannah. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, <clears throat> I think the panel operators might have my proposed motion. Um, I'd like to add this to what's been put forward as a recommended policy. Uh, that the policy be expanded to include a detailed section on memorial donated garden seats similar to other local, state and federal government entities that cater for this. That the policy ensures that council retains complete control over granting or otherwise of such requests, including but not limited to their location, style, etc., with all costs associated, including administrative costs and an allowance for maintenance to be met by the applicant. That council only agree to such requests where there is a need for additional seating or an existing seat is earmarked for replacement or an opportunity arises for applicants to fund the installation of seats in newly created playgrounds, parks and the likes. Should no such need be identified at the time of application, a waiting list be maintained by council to allow an orderly and controlled rollout of donated seats. <coughs> that the policy ensures applicants are aware that council will only be responsible for normal maintenance and acts of vandalism or normal wear and tear necessitating replacement of the seat will be at the cost of the applicant. Should the applicant decline to meet the cost of replacement, council will endeavour to return any plaque affixed to the applicant or other identified family member. The council reserves the right to move the seat to another location should this become necessary for operational or other reasons and that if considered necessary a separate account be established by council to ensure costs associated with this scheme remain transparent and fully funded and that an expanded report incorporating all of the above be prepared by the general manager or her delegate and listed on the agenda of the relevant April 2023 committee meeting for consideration. Thank you, Councillor That's what Hannah. I'm proposing. Thank you. Any speakers? Yeah, look, uh, I'm happy to uh, support uh, Councillor uh, motion. Uh, I think when you worry about the seats, I mean, memorial <laughs> seats, a great idea. And Obviously, this is not going to open a floodgate of applications because I'm not quite sure whether other councils are really. It's pretty much a cost of around seven to ten thousand dollars. So unless uh, people are prepared to pay that, and and what we've got to also remember um, that you know there will be council fees and charges, and it will be an application, and it's probably I'm not quite sure whether it's part of that motion where it comes back for a council resolution on the night when they do apply. Would that be correct, <coughs> Councillor Hannah? I, I think it'd be yeah. guided by a policy um, and it would have the information in the policy. So um, with the the committee, what comes back to committee would be um, the expanded report including the policy. Are you happy with that? So just on the last point, adding including the updated policy and then 
that will guide the process and councillors can review that at the next committee. Um, any other speakers? Yes. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, should there be something included? Sorry. Sorry. I am. <laughs> Sorry, Councillor Musk. I was nearly standing up. Um, could something be included um, in regarding if the families are deceased? What happens then to any of the memorial seats yeah, in regard? We can, we can incorporate um, something. Just so incorporate it's in covered. the policy. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Musket. So, Councillor so that, Sooner. That's the question I had. So, what's the extent of the fully funded if the family passes away? The funding stops. So, it's something that can be dealt with, I guess, in the committee. Yep. And the other thing I was going to suggest was, um, it's only for individuals. It's not for organisations, because organisations tend to sneak and put a plaque there and create some sort of shrine to certain things. And it's happened in the past with trees we've planted um, and becomes a memorial location for people to come and do, excuse me, do things um, that are historic in their organisations. So you've got to be clear on exactly who can do what. Thank you, Councillor Sunis. Well, I'm, I'm assuming this um, is in regards to sort of standard issue um, council furniture, so the apl application would be for that. So um, I don't think that you know, there would be that much issue around that de -access accession of it if um, someone passes away. But I think it's a good initiative and I'm happy to support this also. And I don't think there will be like, people racing at the gates. Like, so I'm just curious to know as part of the council, uh, council officer's research um, on those councils that do have this policy, was the question asked um, to them what the uptake rate of this was by um, applicants? Because I think we'd only be talking about two or three or not very many a year. Yeah. We can put that can be something that also is embedded in the report when it comes to committee. All right, I put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against, declare it carried. All right, um, 10.5 is the Sydney Coastal Councils Group election of a new council representative. Nominations? I nominate Councillor Douglas. Um, Councillor Morrissey, but due to work commitments, it's a bit difficult. So, um, can I um, second Councillor Douglas's nomination? Yep, thank you. Um, do we have a second for Councillor Sooners? Thank you. Um, <laughs> now you've caused a vote. <laughs> All right, so can you have two or is it just one? So before we go to a vote, we can have um, one and an alternative. Is there anyone, either of you, that are happy to be the alternate? We can. Well, well, don't give away your spot if you. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there's no alternative. There's no alternative. Sorry, <laughs> one position. That's it. So, um, all right, we're gonna have to um, go to a vote. <laughs> all right. Um, so we'll go to a vote. So um, all the we'll, um, councillor Douglas, um, all those in favour, say aye. I actually, I'm going to have to get you to put your hands up. <laughs> aye for those in councillor Douglas. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, I declare councillor Douglas. Um, as the Sydney Postal's representative. And we look forward to hearing what comes out. Thank you very much. All right, that then takes us to... Oh, all those in favour of Councillor Douglas say aye. aye. 
against declare it carried. Thank you. All right, 10.60. This is for any councillors wishing to attend the Australian Local Government um, Association National Assembly, which is every year held in Canberra. Please put your hand up if you would like to attend. Councillor Jansen, Werner, Douglas, Cedrac. Um, if you can confirm in the next by the end in the next week, because we need to make the booking. Councillor Awada. So maybe a question mark next to Awada and Cedric. All right. Um, we endorse we endorse those councillors. All those in favour say aye. Against declare it carried. The next one is the waste conference, which is so just a, a process point. So I think this was um, also stand up, please, the, Councillor Werner. So, oh yeah, sorry. Um, so this was actually about uh, calling for notices of motion as well. And I just wanted to ask a question um, through the chair: if we can propose notices of motion at the next council meeting, or if that's too late. What's the deadline? It's for March anyway. Okay. Yeah. Point four. All right, so that's done. Now we move to 10.7 Waste Conference 2023, which is in Coffs Harbour. Please put your hand up if you'd like to be nominated for the Waste Conference. We'll put Councillor, um, so Councillor Jansen. Who else? Councillor Werner. Um, Councillor Naji with a question mark. Any others? Yeah. Councillor Awada and Councillor Barlow with a question mark. Oh. Not Awada. Any others? Question mark for Councillor Cedric. Councillor Sue, does anyone go and dance? You want to go? Ah. Um, so, Councillor Sunis, Meredith Sunis. Yep. All right. Um, please, all sorry, those. Sh sh can I be a question mark as well, please? Um, it, an email will come around in the within the week for a confirmation. So please respond to that. Um, all those in favour say aye. aye. Against, declare it carried. This takes us to um, the minutes of the committee, 11.1004, the voice to parliament and Uluru statement. Um, Councillor Barlow, you pulled that out. Once again, it's a state issue, a federal issue. I'm more concerned about the money um, but we didn't, that wasn't the resolution. Sorry? There, there, there was no money spent. That wasn't the final. Oh, okay. the, well, the resolution I'm, was changed in well, the minutes. That's, that's my problem with this whole system. I don't, I can't find it. But anyway, that's fine then. As long yeah. as there's no money spent, I don't mind. With no, the... because what we, what we um, have come to understand is that there is materials that are being provided to council. So we will use those materials. Thank you. Um. Um, sorry, Madam Mayor, can I speak to this motion? Um, I'm glad Councillor Barlow pulled this out because I didn't want to speak to this. Um, I, I also had concerns over the committee paper that said we were going to spend $50,000 mm. producing collateral, which I think is just bad value for money apart from anything else. Um, but I think it would be, you know, and I'm not proposing to change the motion, um, but we have these fantastic, um, fantastic electronic billboards um, around Sydney Airport, yeah. the gateway to Sydney. Um, whatever collateral we do get, we should make sure that we're using those spaces to, to broadcast our support for the voice loud and clear on those um, as people as people enter yeah. enter the enter Sydney. Um, I think it's a fantastic opportunity and utilising our existing resources. Yeah, thank you. Um, so just so that councils are clear, what the final recommendation was, was that the draft program be noted, that as a first step, council seeks 
potential opportunities for collaboration through SS Rock in relation to the development of resources and um, that a budget proposal be provided during the development of the 23-24 budget process. So, um, yeah, so at this point in time, um, we, Council will put together something to come to committee, which will include those suggestions. Thank you, Councillor McDougall. All right. Sorry, Madam Mayor, can I ask a question? Not to be political. Are we going to look at for and against, or is it just for? You voted for with the mayoral minute we did at the end of last year. So we're not looking at potentially the opposition. Uh, we might refer. Sorry, if we I, might refer to just, general um, manager. Clarify. So, you have made a number of decisions on this as council. We will be coming back to committee in March to absolutely clarify that in supporting um, the voice, um, that you are supporting the yes campaign. Mm. So we're going to put it in those terms at the next committee. But we also know that we have an obligation for people to have the information um, on the entire picture to be able to make an informed decision for themselves. So we will be suggesting that council take the yes position and the budget that the mayor spoke of earlier would be for things like creating yes banners, you know, street banners and collateral of that nature that we can display council's leadership in taking a yes position. But I would imagine in our libraries and links on our website, it would be to all of the information that is provided from the federal government for both the yes and the no case. Thank you. All right. Point, Madam Mayor, I don't know whether or not I'd fallen asleep, but I don't think I actually seconded that motion. How did my name get up there? It doesn't, um, well, it's not a motion. It's oh. just, we just discussing something that no, was. Moving it. Oh, sorry. Seconded, Councillor Saranowski. All right. All those in, yeah, it was really a question, so it wasn't. Very quickly, while, while we are talking about this, um, I just wanted to note that the Inner West Council, you know, I know we've talked about them quite a bit tonight, um, but they did hold a very successful barbecue um, doing this recently, and that's definitely something I think we should be looking at as um, part of our program. Thank you, Councillor McDougall. All right, so because we've pulled it out, will um, all those in favour say aye? against declare it carried um 12.2 so it was the ss rock that some of us declared in the three tenders um do i have a mover that didn't declare moved councillor jansen second and councillor saranowski all those in favor say aye against declare it carried um 11.3 so the um, 002 summary of responses from the public exhibition of the draft community and verge garden. So um, this was pulled out. Do I have a mover and a seconder? Moved Councillor Jansen, second Councillor Saranowski. All those in favour say aye. Against, declare it carried. It takes us to item um, the minutes of the city works and assets 11.4. Takes us to 004 new footpath selection criteria. Priority list, do I have a mover? You can't, you've got a conflict. Really? Yeah, moved. Sec moved Councillor Jansen, seconded Councillor Saranowski. All those in favour say aye. Against, declare it carried. Um, 11.5 minutes of the traffic committee. So, um, 137 trial of Bay Street, um, Brighton trial of closure of Bay Street, Brighton Le Sands. So there was a, um, do I have a mover? Move. Moved, Councillor Saranasi, second and Councillor Werner. All those in favour say aye, against, declare it carried. Um, we're continuing on the traffic committee and it takes us to item 011. So this is the Midjurabri Lane, <laughs> Cogra. So um, what happened, just for Council's information, so at the Traffic Committee, um, there was a proposal to extend 
the two hour parking restriction right down along um, Mitchaburi Lane, right down to the end to allow for the um, parking spots to turn over because currently there's no restrictions further down. So some of the businesses are leaving their cars there that from the workshop constantly. And so with the sporting um, and community groups around there, the turnover's not there. So, but at the, at the traffic committee, what happened was they thought it was only on the weekend and then post committee, it, it's during the week as well. So all we're suggesting here is that we extend the two hours from 4 p.m. every weekday and then um, over the weekend. So um, do I have a mover? Mm. So, so what about if we, um, Councillor Saranowski, at another point, which says that um, we re, um, that we evaluate the area in six months' time to see and um, so just stop there and I'll just keep talking. Um, and that will be um, to see whether these new parking restrictions have had an impact and then we can see, do, do they work? Do they need to be changed and what else can yeah. sort of, do you think that? So maybe we say, and um, that ca that surrounding streets yeah. are yeah. investigated yeah. for parking opportunities. Mm. Yeah. All right. Well, that should cover it where we just do an investigation. Just adding to what uh, Councillor Severinovsky was saying, along Production Avenue, there's a lot of abandoned cars. Um, Mercedes with that number plates. There's jet skis <laughs> that are just sitting on the ground. We need to maybe have a, a blitz of what's going on there, have a look at that. And then seriously have a look at, even if you put a four hour parking restriction or, or maybe shorter, they can still use the hospital. We have nothing there at the moment on a lot of the sections there. So we need to look at that. We need to put some no stopping signs at the top of Production Avenue where that that big, um, um, whatever is that, there's a truck that picks up vehicles. It's always parked right on the corner there, especially on a tow truck, the one tabletop, tabletop truck. So we need to put some, statutory signs in, I guess that needs to go to the traffic committee, but vehicles that are unregistered can be looked at now straight away because some of the, um, yeah, exactly. some of the businesses there are taking advantage of what's going on there, the lack of, lack of formality. Okay. Um, well, that was not the original recommendation. It was in the field. Yeah. That public. Okay. All right. No other speakers. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against, declare it carried. Um,
takes us to 11.7 minutes of the Botany Historical Trust meeting. Do I have a move? I move Councillor Jansen. Do I have a second to Councillor Musket? Look, I've just pulled this out because I wanted it noted that the BHT were involved in such a brilliant launch on Saturday of the um, swimming in Botany and, and the Bay. Um, it was an amazing exhibition. Um, the local history staff, I think, should be congratulated. There's definitely some expertise there in those staff, so I'd really like to pass on those congratulations. I also believe on behalf of Councillor Musket too, so that could be passed on to staff. That would be amazing. Yeah, it was a, it was an, it's an excellent exhibition and I encourage all councillors to get out and visit it. It's um, very, very good. Thank you, Councillor Jansen. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against, declare it carried. All right, this takes us to um, 12.3 Notice of Motion Annual Events Program. Moved, Councillor Douglas, seconded, Councillor Jansen. Councillor Douglas. Thank you. Um, I submitted this motion quite early in January when there was um, a strong community response to some events not going ahead. And I just wanted to thank Council for the work at the City Services Committee to address that. And I have tried to share that information widely in the community that the council is looking seriously at uh, ways that we could get sponsorship and enable some of these events like Carols by the Sea and New Year's Eve fireworks potentially to keep going. But also we have to balance out the, the huge costs that some events cause uh, uh, compared to what other events that we can do in the community. So. Um, I, I just yeah, I reiterate that I want to thank the City Services Committee for really addressing those community concerns at that very first meeting uh, this year. In uh, uh, and um, just in terms of my coming back to my motion, I've also it's been pointed out to me that it's not entirely correct. It says in my background supporting statements that there is currently no formal mechanism for community consultation about this events program. In fact, we do actually. Um, uh, consult with the community around the delivery program and the operation plan, um, operating plan, I should say. So I just wanted to actually just um, make an amendment to my motion before we debate it further. Um, that, let me just bring that up, that um, we have better promotion of opportunities for community consultation for the future events program as part of the delivery program and operating plan ensuring that the events programs stand out in these consultations. Um, Are you happy to accept that amendment, Councillor Jansen? Um, yes, is, a, is that amendment um, replacing point one though? Uh, it's yes. tweaking point one. It so yeah, if it's tweaking point one, I'd be happy to yeah, accept that. Point one. Um, so the I might just get you for the purposes to read it out again. That council, um, uh, better promotion of opportunities for community consultation of future events programs as part of the delivery program and operating plan, ensuring that these events programs, programs stand out in these consultations. And I mentioned that last bit just because they're very big public documents and they can get buried within, you know, a lot of information for people. And um, I think that, 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 yeah, that concludes my amendment. Thank you, Councillor Douglas. Um, Councillor Jansen? Well, I, I support that. And I think that th there's probably a way that we can um, alert different um, target audiences to the different parts of that DPOP. Um, because I think consulting DPOP. on the events program, sorry, I, I prefer to say DPOP, <laughs> but consulting on the events program alone could get tricky because council delivers hundreds of events every year. So the ones that seem to matter the most are the ones that are what I would be referring to as the signature events. But I think that there's a lot of, um, sort of planning that goes into those and that information is included in the DPOP. So we need to consider everything that council does holistically um, and note that council, I believe, do a lot of 
um, demographic forecasting and population forecasting and the opportunity to um, provide feedback on that entire program is as part of that um, DPOP exhibition period. So I, I would be, I am supportive of this. Thank you. We might just have to change the first line that says that Bayside Council and then um, and then the next point is, if you're happy, Councillor Douglas, would be um, to, to better promote opportunities. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right. To better promote opportunities. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Any other speakers? Councillor Musk. Quickly. <coughs> oh, sorry. Um, I'd just like to see something included in there about um, informing the general community of the cost factors involved so that they can see just how expensive some items are in comparison to whether we have one big one or whether we have smaller, you know, events over the different wards. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Musket. Councillor Ballow? Well, it's just <coughs> a comment that, because um, we had that uh, report come forward and as long as the councillors are involved, you know, we went out, we looked at some of the fields and we, I went to Bexley, then I went to Brighton, the field that was nominated was the wrong one. So it's a matter of talking to us because they nominated a very small area, no public toilet, flooded. We're on the other side of Ramsgate Road, you've got Tunbridge Reserve, beautiful toilets, a canteen, if it football whoever owns that so just with consult consultation with maybe the ward councils when they're planning something like that because they're the ones with the know what's around yeah thank you <coughs> Councillor Barlow all right um I put the motion all those in favour say aye, aye. against aye. declare it carried um that takes us to 12.4 notice of motion use of personal watercraft um moved Councillor Douglas seconded Councillor McDougall um, would you like to speak, Councillor Douglas? Sure, thank you. Um, so again, this was um, su I submitted this quite early in the summer um, without proper consultation with the council staff, uh, but I was really trying to react to what seems to be getting worse and worse each summer, which is uh, the, basically the, the, the takeover of the beach with vehicles on the beach and a lot of safety issues around that. So I know it's not an, a problem that's unique just to Bayside. They're also dealing with the same problem in Melbourne. They've gone through um, some legislative changes there around where the watercraft is actually allowed to be. But I want to make clear that uh, we, as a council, don't have jurisdiction over making those decisions because it's state government, that uh, the, bo the body of water. So. Um, I suggest that we actually take out part two of the motion, um, but instead uh, potentially put something like uh, building on what the general manager has suggested um, that Bayside Council make a write a letter or make a submission to the New South Wales government around their marine safety regulation that ensures all users of our waterways have safe experience out on the water. Yep, so maybe then the motion becomes that community advocate to the um, probably maritime New South Wales um, to increase or what, what do we want them to do, Meredith? <laughs> <laughs> in Botany Bay, particularly when I want to go to the opposite beach. Yeah. It's really better regulation mm. in the Olympic Coast Beach. Yeah. See, I knew you'd know. <laughs> <laughs> so then, um, so so you're, you're happy with just number two as the motion? Can we still keep number one? Because I think it's important for us as a council to continue to have a portal 
where we can collect information around these sort of problem behaviours so that when we end up in discussions with the state bodies, yeah. We can do um, a map like the Hooning map. Yeah. Um, we probably will need to leave it open for, leave it open, yeah, for the next um, summer. So maybe we just change the, um, that Bayside, um, maybe that Bayside create a have your say for community to um, report antisocial behaviour and problem hotspots on our on our waterways, mm -hmm. and that covers everything then. You happy with that, Councillor Douglas? Yeah. Councillor McDougall? Any other speakers? All those in favour say aye. aye. Against, declare it carried. Okay, um, 12.5, notice of motion reducing period poverty in Bayside. Moved, Councillor Werner, second. Second, Councillor Douglas. Um, Councillor Werner? Um, so this is a motion um, uh, for council to receive a report from council officers on a pilot program of supplying free period products in council-run libraries, pools, community centres, sporting ground change rooms and highly utilised public toilets. The report includes an assessment of the need for the service and the costs. And then number two, that council consults with the re relevant community organisations, health services, schools and sports clubs about the pilot um, in developing the program. And um, yeah, I just wanted to say that, that I'm sure that um, anyone who's ever felt themselves in need of period products and then realised that they don't have any um, can probably um, relate to this motion. It's about um, providing uh, in... Um, providing the products uh, in those um, uh, public toilets and so on. Uh, this is something that's actually um, being done all across the world. So, for example, as I said in the supporting statement, um, the period products are being supplied in Scotland in all public buildings under Scottish legislation, also in New Zealand and New Zealand schools and also in Victorian schools. And the New South Wales Department of Education is trialling a schools program in, um, oh, it says in 2021. Yeah, so they've done it already. So um, I think this shows um, it's something that's that's obviously needed. A lot of uh, government organisations are getting on board and, and doing that. So I think it would be a really good idea for council to adopt a similar program. And um, this could be uh, just in libraries or it could be just in sports, um, uh, in, in the public toilets, at, at sporting uh, facilities, or it could be both. So this is something that um, obviously we, we can, uh, you know, it can be decided later once there is a report. So again, the motion calls for a report to um, find out what we can do and what the costs would be and um, I would um, invite everyone to support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Werner. Are there any speakers? Councillor Jansen. Look, I just, um, I, I hear what you're saying, but I'd, there's a couple of models that are mentioned in, in there. So I'd like to um, suggest that we wait until the Inner West trial is finished and then receive a report to um, the relevant committee and that's because I've noticed that there's an increasing trend away from those um, single-use disposable menstrual products and there's more and more uptake of period undies. So they're becoming more and more accessible in supermarket aisles. They're cheaper. Um, so I think also in the meantime, we could be um, providing a basket of um, you know, sanitary products at our council libraries and pools just until that trial is 
finish. So I would be um, recommending a, a, an amendment to that, um, if you're happy with that. And that would be that um, once the Inner West trial is finished, we receive a report back to the relevant committee. And number two, that um, council provide a basket of um, sanitary products that are available. Emergency. Uh, in emergency situations um, at council staffed libraries and the pools. Um, yeah. So Are I you happy to accept that amendment? Uh, yes, I'm happy to accept that. Thank you, Council Werner. So, um, so we remove, um, we, the first one becomes that council receives um, a report um, to, com to the relevant committee once the Inner West trial is finished. Um, and so remove two. And oh, yeah, remove that. And then two, that council provide um, a basket of sanitary products for emergency use in our libraries and pools. So that would just be, um, a, you know, a packet of pads and a packet of tampons in case someone gets caught out um, in, a, in a situation. So any other discussion? Um, Angela Onestis is, it's not our once we Once we take ownership. Well, I'm going to say, what's all? I'm just saying that, uh, and the cost factor that in the West have said is 225,000, it's a lot of money. Yeah. It's, half, it's a small playground. True. All right, no further speakers. All those in favour, say aye. aye. Do you really want to enter this conversation, Councillor Cedric? <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Cedric, I can um, bring mine in and show you. Maybe we'll take it offline. Councillor Jansen can explain it later. <laughs> all right. All those in favour say aye. Against, declare it carried. That takes us to um, 12.6, notice of motion in relation to playgrounds. Move Councillor McDougall, seconded Councillor Cedric. Uh, would you like to speak? Uh, look, I'm aware it's 10.30, so I'll just speak very briefly. And speaking of small playgrounds, um, these are two fantastic little parks. They're both constrained um, and as a result, a little bit neglected. Um, but I would really like to see us investigate what can be done at these parks. Um, they are well used and well loved by locals um, and putting some time and money into them, I think would be well worthwhile. Thank you. Any other speakers? Well, Councillor Park, I don't know, Councillor McDougall mustn't have seen the Facebook page. You're getting it done now, right at this moment. It, it's already done. I mean, it's on its way. So on Kendall Street Reserve, I haven't seen it, but I don't want parks to be uh, jumped ahead just because a councillor says it. I feel it should be... A so if you look at the wording now, it says be reviewed. In to the be next financial, yeah. So it's not. It's suggesting that um, that we look at the spaces as far as um, Good, because there's plenty of other little parks and they could be older. I've got mm -hmm. one that's 1997, but Hasselhoff is out of is redundant. It's on its way. So okay. Thank you, Councillor Barlow. Yeah, Any other out. speakers? I just Although, oh, sorry, sorry, I just think there is actually some community consultation going on, asking for feedback from the community on what they want for that park. So that's something that we can share with our community as well to get involved. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think the, it was published after the business paper was published, oh. Councillor Barlow, <laughs> which I, I, get re, I get results immediately. <laughs> All right. All those in favour say aye. Against, declare it carried. Um, 12.7 notice of motion, syringes on the foreshore. Move Councillor McDougall, second at Councillor Cedrat. Would you like to speak? Self, any speakers? So you can see from, um, you know, the information that there's quite, you know, there's a daily raking 
that occurs on our beaches. So um, we've, we're um, looking at where there is, um, are there particular hot spots and um, asking any residents that raise concerns to actually um, say exactly where it is so that those areas can be monitored. Any speakers? I caught the, oh, Councillor Hannah. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, look, I have had some representations about this. Um, I, I don't know that it's actually widespread, but I think it is. does tend to be concentrated around the Brighton area, Brighton or Sands area. That seems to be. <clears throat> so I don't know what possibly more could be done, but if we could just have a look to see whether or not, you know, there are a couple more things that could be tweaked just to, you know, whether or not we have some sharp... Mm. receptacle things or, or whatever but um, it has come up a bit and I have had some representations from residents that have got small children and they're, they're yeah. a bit concerned about it so yeah no okay. definitely thank, we'll thank we'll you uh, write, a reply. write a reply um yeah it's because I do acknowledge that and as it says in the motion um the council staff do an incredible job um cleaning up the beach it's a it's, it's a bit of a battle sometimes that's there's a lot of rubbish left there, um, but obviously it is a very scary thing to see a needle on the beach um, with small children playing. Um, and if there are options for us to have things like sharp bins or other things that follow best practice, um, definitely if we can look at those, that would be great. Thank you, Councillor McDougall. Um, all those in favour say aye. aye. Against, declare it carried. Um, last motion of the night, 12.8. Rodent problem. Cook Park. Move Council McDougall, second to Council Cedrac. Would you like to speak? Um, yeah, sure. And if you could scroll down, I think I've changed the wording of the motion. Um, in line with uh, it's our, our community, read, read the business paper, obviously. And I've been called by a couple of other people expressing concerns about rodents. Um, and also thank you to councillors who have raised some of the other issues with the baiting program. Um, I understand that our baiting program is sympathetic to other wildlife, but I just want to make very clear um, that this should, if you could again scroll down to the amended motion, um, that this should be done uh, in such a way as to minimise harm to non-pest animals, whether those be domestic animals or native wildlife, um, with particular care paid to minimise harm to birds, such as raptors and owls. Um, obviously, there's not going to be no harm here. That's the nature of a baiting program. Um, but this is also a public health issue. Um, I walk along along the foreshore almost every night and the number of rats running around is, is incredible. Um, we're walking from Brighton to Ramsgate, regularly see sort of between 20 and 30 rats, including dead rats on the path. Um, it's not healthy, uh, it's an issue. They get into our bins, they rip them up. Um, mm. This might sound like a trivial issue, but it is something we should, do, we should take action on. Um, which I understand council staff regularly do, but we've had a particularly hot and humid summer and it does cause um, rodents to breed. Uh, so just raising this again, that we should renew our efforts um, to keep our area clean, healthy and safe. Thank you, Councillor McDougall. That council take appropriate action. One thing I've noticed going down to the beach fairly often is those large wheelie bins we have, the very large ones, they usually have a plug missing from the bottom. Not that I've looked, but when I use them at work for other things, they have a plug missing. And generally the rats get into there because there's a lot of food that people throw in. Wow. And you can hear them at night. As you walk 10 o'clock at night, you can hear them rattling away. Yeah. So if we okay. at least take away opportunities, yeah, they do. They... Yeah, well, I don't know about that. But if you take away the opportunity, oh, okay. All right, be stupid, all right. No, thank you for that suggestion. Councillor Cedra. Just with those bins, I know that they do those holes specifically on purpose so the weather and the rain can... So maybe if we could, instead of them so big, I have seen they drill them, um, they drill holes that are really thin. No, no, I know, I know, but they, they unplug it so that the water drains. Okay, okay, whatever. All right, I'm sure staff can investigate some options. Um, Councillor Fardell. I'd like to support um, Councillor McDougall's motion and particularly the part about what um, minimise harm to birds such as raptors and owls and other native wildlife and domestic animals. Um, 
Most pest extermination companies use the second generation anticoagulant source, SGARs, and they are just devastating our native, native wildlife right across Australia. Now, some other countries have banned it. Canada actually had a trial back in um, 2021, and at the end of the trial, uh, British Columbia, part of Canada, has actually banned the use because what happens is the rats eat this poison. They don't die immediately. It takes them days or weeks to die. They actually keep on ingesting it till it builds up in their body. Then they die the most dreadful death. In fact, if you're somewhere where there's um, watering systems in your garden and you notice they're being dug up, that's because the rats are dying of this and it makes them very thirsty. So they start digging up your garden to get to the water because they're just dying of thirst. It's a horrible thing. So what happens is then the rats die or the mice die. The raptors, particularly at night time, find a dead rat, think, great, don't have to go hunting, eat it. Now, often the adult birds can survive, but they'll feed them to their chicks. The chicks will die. So these are a lot of these birds are already endangered. And this is happening everywhere. And this is not just um, people making it up. BirdLife Australia, the biggest organisation in Australia and the oldest um, bird conservation organisation, actually does autopsies on birds. And a significant number have died from rodenticide poisoning. So it's really important. I have brought this up with council before and it was more or less dismissed and all of our pest exterminators know what they do. Well, the pest exterminators will use this because it's the cheapest and easiest option. They're not the ones carrying out autopsies on the birds. They don't really know, and not being, you know, horrible, but they probably don't really care. They just want to do their job. So I'm saying what um, Councillor McDougall is saying is that we really need to look into this. There are other methods. Where I live, I nag them to death about it, and finally they introduced other baiting measures. Um, they're actually rodent traps with a um, that kills them instantly. They've got peanut butter inside them. Now, they are a bit more expensive. They're a bit more labour-intensive. Um, but it means the rats don't die a dreadful death. I mean, maybe we couldn't care less about rats, but still I feel we should be humane. And it means that we're not going to get um, raptors and owls and even magpies and currawongs and kookaburras dying. And there's also small mammals that are dying from it too. Um, anything that eats meat, basically. It's a really big problem, and BirdLife Australia has been trying for years to... Um, talk to the government about this because it's such a huge problem. So I'm just saying, please look into it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fidel. Councillor Jansen. Just a quick question through you, Madam um, Chair. Does, do the rat baiting programs distinguish between um, native rats versus uh, pet rats? I mean, pet rats. <laughs> <laughs> pet, pet, pet. We might. <laughs> we'll take that on notice, I think. Um, any other? Okay. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if we could include um, Councillor Fardell's uh, comments in the motion. It talks about um, such as domestic animals and native life, so it's been added. Yeah. Um, no, for the right of reply. Okay, all those in favour say aye. aye. Against, declare it carried. This takes us to um, questions with notice. Any questions with notice have been submitted. We'll just do a scroll, please. Thank you. Keep scrolling. Scroll one. Okay. That's, um, thank you, councillors. I declare them, not bad actually, I declare the meeting closed.